Hello everyone this is part 19 of what if Naruto was banished and becomes rakage, and I hope you guys enjoy this video and to like, to subscribe, to see more comment down below, now let's start the intro. Last time on rakage. Excuse me rakage san, but who exactly are these girls? Asked Gara, who like everyone else in the Suna and Kanoa groups, was wondering who the three girls were and what their relationship to Naruto was. Oh yeah sorry about that, said Naruto with a small smile, Hokage-san, Kazekage-san, everyone, allow me to introduce you to Nene, green-haired girl, Yoshiko, pink-haired girl, and Yami, blonde-haired girl, my daughters. In Naruto's office. The very moment that Naruto said that the three girls were his daughters, the jaws of practically everyone in the two groups hit the floor. Naruto has kids. Thought a dumbstruck Kiba. Naruto's a father. Thought a stupefied Aruka, who couldn't believe that Naruto had three daughters. I don't believe it, the brat has brats of his own, thought Sunid, who was about ready to hit the bottle after hearing this. When did this happen? Thought a surprised Kakashi. Who would have believed that the kid already has three daughters? Thought Jiraiya, who was already trying to guess who the mother of the three girls was. No way. Thought Eno. Well this was certainly unexpected, Neji thought when he heard this news. Troublesome, muttered Shikamaru, as if the girls were anything like Naruto, they would be hell raises. So he has children of his own now, thought Danzo, believing that he may have found something that he could use against Naruto. Naruto-kun really does have a family now, Hinata thought sadly, since Naruto seemed even further away from her now, than he was when she learned he was married. It was then at this point that the group were joined by an out-of-breath Uzumaki Kisaragi Yuffie, who was another one of Naruto's wives and was accompanied by three of her wolf summons, who she had obviously been using to track the girls. Pant, pant, finally caught up to you three, pant, pant, said the tired Yuffie, who had clearly been chasing after the three girls. Yuffie, where have you been? You were supposed to be watching the girls, scolded Nanao. I tried, but you know how wily Nene and Yoshiko are, and they talk Yami into almost anything. Not to mention, you know how fast and good they are at hiding, hell even Swarthon and her shock division have trouble finding the three of them at times. That still doesn't excuse you for letting them run around, since they just barraged right into Naruto's office when he was having his meeting with the Hokage and the Kazekage, stated Nanao. Oh please don't you go all high and mighty with me Nanao or have you forgotten what happened two months ago when it was your turn to watch the girls. After they got away from you, they broke into the shock and bolt division locker rooms and bleached their uniforms and colored their the bolt nins masks pink and the shock nins masks orange. 1. After being reminded of this, Nanao blushed from embarrassment, even though Naruto wasn't angry over the incident and actually laughed about the whole thing. It was still very embarrassing for her, since she was supposed to keep the girls out of trouble. When the Sunid, Gara, and the others heard this, this further proved to them that the girls were definitely Naruto's daughters, since they had clearly inherited his love for pranks, or at least Nene and Yoshiko had. Eventually after a few minutes, the Suna and Kanoa representatives got over their shock, although could not help but stare at the three young girls and Naruto. Since many of them were still having trouble accepting the fact that Naruto of all people was now a father. So these are the representatives of Konohagakur no Sato, the village hidden in the leaf, and Sunagakur no Sato, the village hidden in the sand, commented Yami. Yes, this here is the godime Hokage Sunid and her party and this man here is the godime Kazekage Gara and his brother, sister, wife and sensei, replied Naruto. I am honored to meet you both, said Yami in the same monotone-like voice and expressionless eyes and did a slight bow. As we are to meet you Yami-san and your sisters, Gara replied with a slight nod. Call your Sabaku no Gara, Gara of the Sand Waterfall, to Sand says you're super strong and can do loads of cool things with Sand, said Nene as she walked up to Gara. To San, also say you're just like him, Uncle B, Mama Yugito and Mama Fu, added Yoshiko, as she walked up to Gara with her sister. At this, Gara and the others looked at Naruto in surprise at Nene and Yoshiko knowing that Naruto and others were Jinchuriki. But Naruto simply replied that he kept no secrets from his daughters. Your father does me great honor in his praise and yes I hold a biju, like your father and your mother's. Could you show us some things that you can do, ha, ha, ha. 
Yoshiko asked excitedly. Yay can you, please, please Polia see. Added Nene, where she did the same puppy eye dog look that she gave her father earlier, hopping it break Gara. Now girls, this isn't exactly the time or the place for those short of things. Besides the Kazekage is not here to entertain you, said Naruto as she scolded his two youngest daughters lightly. Unfortunately the girls ignored their father's scolding and turned their attention to the Kanoa members, where they started calling some of the member different names like Kiba Dog Breath, Kakashi Cyclops, Sakura Forehead, Lee Centipede Brows and Eno Pig. This of course irked most of the members, where they turned and glared slightly at Naruto, who just gave a cheesy looking smirk. But the most humorous was when the two girls turned to Sunid, and you're the old hag, Grandma Sunid. At this remark, a very large tick mark appeared on Sunid's head as she reined in her temper, so not to cause an incident. Although she did hear some slight snickers coming from certain members of her company. After which she then turned to glare at Naruto, who turned away as he fought back a growing smirk. Hey Nene Nene, is that who I think it is? Asked Nene as she turned to Jiraiya who was standing next to Sunid. Oh yay, that's definitely him alright, stated her pink-haired twin. Oh so you know me, said Jirai thinking Naruto must have told them how he used to train him. Yay we've heard, lots, about you, you are, said Nene with a devilish smirk, that was all too much like her father before she and her twin both cried, Ero Senen. Together, which caused Toad Sage to fall flat on his face in disbelief. Damn it you got them calling me that too. Jiraiya cried angrily as she slowly picked himself up off the ground and glared slightly at Naruto who just grinned, while nearly everyone else in the room snickered or laughed at the Toad Sage's expense. Listen carefully you two little smart Alex, I am the great Jiraiya, a man among men, who can capture any maiden's heart and have defeated the mightiest of villains, declared Jiraiya as he puffed out his chest. At the end of this little speech, both Nene and Yoshiko looked completely unimpressed, where Yoshiko then turned their father. Yes to san you were right, he really does like the sound of his own voice. At this remark everyone burst out laughing, which further irritated Jiraiya, causing him to mutter how disrespectful kids today were towards their elders. You know I've about half a mind to bend you over my knee or give you both a good spanking. Yay right, like a dirty old fart like you could, my sisters and I could take you down with one jutsu, declared Nene. Ha, I like to see you try that brat, laughed Jiraiya. At this challenge, both Nene and Yoshiko once again had the same identical smirk that Naruto was known to have when he was young, which actually made Jiraiya worry a little. Hey Yamine, let's show Ero Senen that special jutsu that Tusan helped us come up with, said Nene as she turned to her elder blonde sibling. While at the same time causing a confused look to appear on Naruto face not sure what technique Nene was talking about. I do not believe that Jutsu would be appropriate here sister, especially considering the provocative stance it holds, replied Yami little to no expression. Oh come, it'll be fun, not to mention it'll put this guy in his place, urged Yoshiko. After about a minute or so more of pleading from her younger siblings, Yami let out a slight sigh before relenting. Very well then, I will capitulate, although I still hold my reservations of using it and do not see the value of it. It was in that moment that Naruto, suddenly realized what the girls were talking about and tried to stop them, knowing what would happen to him once they did the jutsu. Sadly before Naruto could stop them, the three girls each did a ram seal, where a puff of smoke covered each of them. Enter Naruto OST sexiness. As the smoke slowly dissipated, the rest of the people in the room could see that the girls took on new forms, which had strong similarities to a certain jutsu they were all familiar with in some way. The first of the girls to be fully seen was Yoshiko, who took the form of medium tall girl with long pink hair, which fell below her waist. But the thing that caught most people's attention was that Yoshiko was naked, although thankfully a thin layer of smoke covered her chest and groin. But it still left enough to show that Yoshiko's new form was filled out in just the right places in both curves and chest. 2. The next to be seen was Nene, who also took on the form of a medium tall girl, but had long bright green hair that reached down to her hips. Although unlike Yoshiko's form she did not appear naked, instead she appeared in a bright pink sexy bunny girl outfit, which helped to highlight her curvy figure and ample cleavage. 3. And last but not least to be revealed was Yami, who took on the form of tall young girl with long blonde hair and bright crimson eyes, which gave her an exotic look. She was dressed in a sexy black two-piece bathing suit, which did not hide her impressive bust or her hourglass-like figure. 
The fact that she still maintained an expressionless look on her face, gave her a sort of an allure, which made people want to stare at her constantly. 4. Upon seeing the three girls' new forms, Jiraiya, Konohamaru, Kiba and Kankuro were blast back into some of Naruto's bookshelves, by large nosebleeds and all of them had perverted grins on their faces. Hush, I guess it through what they say, no matter how much things change some things always remain the same, though Kakashi with a slight sigh, as she saw Naruto daughter use the jutsu he created when he was a kid. After seeing the girls' forms, any remaining doubt that the other Suna and Kanoa representatives had about the girls being Naruto's daughters left. Since only Naruto's children would know his Oirok no jutsu, sexy technique. End Naruto OST sexiness. As soon Yuria and the others were blasted back by their nosebleeds, Naruto was on the receiving end of a three-way bash onto the head by Yugito, Fu and Okatsu, who all shouted Barker. At the same time, this was then followed by a furious Nanao, throwing her oversized book right into Naruto's face, causing him to fall backwards and slam his head onto the floor. You idiot we told you not to teach the girls that perverted jutsu. Shouted a furious Yugito. And don't think for one second that you won't be punished for this. Since we told you quite clearly what would happen, if you taught the girls that deplorable thing you call a jutsu, rounded an angry Nanao. Who had walked by Sunid and the others and went up to join Yugito and the other girls and was towering over a now cowering Naruto. Naturally upon seeing this, the remaining other representatives had large sweat drops on their heads. Since it wasn't every day that one would see Uzumaki Naruto, the Rokudime Rakage and famed Raiden no Kami, God of Thunder and Lightning who was now recognized strongest shinobi and cage in the shinobi world, on his knees cowering before the wrath of his wives. Some although, mainly male members, had sympathetic looks on their faces, as given what they were seeing, Yugito and the other girls' wrath was something to be feared and not taken lightly. BB but I DD didn't teach them I it, I swear replied the nervous Naruto. The how the hell did they learn it? Rounded Fu angrily. We learned it from watching Tu San when he showed it to us that one time, answered Nene as she and her sibling returned to normal. What? cried the four wives together, before they turned back to Naruto and once again roared Barker. As they gave him a four-way bash to the head and then started to yell at him for showing the girls the technique. At the same time Naruto's other wives Takara, Taira and Yuffie stayed back and watched the whole event. Both Taira and Yuffie had amused smirks, as they were enjoying the whole spectacle, Takara on the other hand just sighed, as something like this wasn't exactly unusual for their family. Killer B although was enjoying the show about as much as Taira and Yuffie were and was laughing his ass off and talking to Hachibi inside his mind and saying how Naruto was whipped. You knucklehead, what were you thinking when you showed him that jutsu? yelled Fu angrily. TTTH they wanted T to see it or after I told them of some old pranks I did when I was a kid, replied the now fearful Naruto. Is this true? asked Okatsu as she turned to her daughters with a frown, making both Nene and Yoshiko very nervous, where both of them had the same cheesy grins and started scratching the back of their heads, not unlike Naruto when he was younger. Yami on the other hand, stayed completely expressionless. To be more exact, Nene-san and Yoshiko-san pleaded with Oto-sama to show them the technique. After he told us of some of his escapades when he was around our age, once they saw it, they asked me to help them recreate it, where we combined it with the special transformation technique that Unohana-sama taught us, answered Yami with her usual blank face. Wait, you mean the special henge transformation that allows you to transform into your adult forms? Asked Nanao as she turned to her daughter, where Yami just nodded. Okay, just hold on one second here, spoke Kiba after waking up, you're saying that the forms they took just now, was what they'll look like when they are adults. When we're 18 to be precise, responded Yami, surprising everyone. Damn, thought Kiba, since he knew once Naruto's daughters grew up, the three of them were going have boys coming after them, left and right. At hearing this, a look suddenly appeared on Jirai's, who had also woke up from his short nap. But as quickly as this look appeared on his face, it disappeared when a small bolt of lightning flew between his legs, narrowly missing a certain body part. Don't even think about using, my, daughters in one of your books Toad. Not unless you want your balls fried off, stated Naruto as he stood up and glared at his former sensei, while emanating some lightning from his right hand to make his point clear. And if that wasn't enough, Nanao, Yugito and the other girls, including Takara, Taira, Yuffie, all started to glare at the Toad Sage and leak killing intent. 
clearly indicating that they were of the same mind, even Yuffie's wolf summonses were with them, where they started growling at the Senan. Gulping Jiraiya nodded his head violently, telling them that he understood perfectly. Eventually though, the excitement died down and Naruto told his daughters that they had to go and that he would see them later tonight. Ua, but we want to stay with you too sand moaned Yoshiko. I'm sorry Yoshiko, but you two should know better, I've a lot of important things to do and you three would be very bored just staying here with me, said Naruto. Oh Okarai, we understand stand, replied Nene sadly, but if we can't hang out here, do you think you can summon out Muko, clear a sea? Begged the green-haired girl. As she used her infamous puppy dog look and was joined by her sister Yoshiko, who did the same. It of course did not take long for them to break their father, when Naruto sighed and said, fine. Naturally when Yugito and the other girls saw this, they could only smile in amusement, since both Yoshiko and Nene had Naruto wrapped around their fingers and they knew it. After biting his finger, Naruto did some quick hand seals and placed his hand onto the ground and cried, Kuchio's no jutsu, summoning technique. After which a small puff of smoke erupted, where once it dissipated a small white tiger cub appeared, and let out small but cut little cry, that others guessed was its roar. 5. When the others saw the little tiger cub, several girls like Ino, Sakura and Temari had to fight hard to suppress the urge to scream, kawaii, and squeeze the little tiger cub to death. Once the small tiger cub appeared, Nene quickly went over to it and picked it up, where her twin then went over to her and started to pet the young cub, who purred, indicating that it liked it. Now play nice with Muko, as he's still only a cub, you don't want his father Bayako angry at you, said Naruto. We will, answered Nene. Yeah we promise, replied Yoshiko. Before the girls left with your fee, Yami turned to look back at Naruto, will you be coming tomorrow for the final exam and graduation Oto-sama? I can't promise anything Yami, since I've an important meeting tomorrow with Iwa, but I'll do my best. At this Yami just nodded, while still keeping her face void of emotion and said, I understand, before leaving with her sisters, Yafi and her wolf summons. Once the girls left and the doors to his office closed, Sunid turned to Naruto. They are not your children really. Stated Sunid, since she found it highly unlike for Naruto to be their father, since both Nene and Yoshiko were about eight. Meaning that Naruto had to be about 14 when the girls were born, although it wouldn't be impossible for Naruto to be their father, she just found it highly unlikely. It was even less likely for Naruto to be Yami's father since she was 12, meaning that she had already been born before Naruto was even banished from Kanoa. They are my daughters, Su and Naruto replied simply, as he went back his desk and picked up his chair, which had been knocked down when Yoshiko and Nene jumped on top of him and sat back down. No I mean, said Sunid but before she could finish speaking, Naruto held up his hand to stop her. I know what you meant Sunid and yes you're right, biological speaking I'm not the girl's father, nor are Yugito and the others, the girl's biological mother. But as far as we are concerned, they are our daughters and as far as they're concerned we are their parents. So you adopted them, stated Gara. Yes, I adopted them during civil war here, Naruto answered. So what happened to their parents? Asked Temari, who was curious as to why Naruto would adopt three girls. At this question, Naruto sighed and for a moment a sorrowful look appeared on his visage before it quickly disappeared. Four months after Anasu, Okatsu and I joined the rebel factions in their war against the former Lightning Daimyo and the god I'm Rakage. I led a large team of rebel shinobi, in raiding a small enemy supply base. We succeed in destroying the base and taking all the supplies, but soon after found ourselves being pursued by a large team of the god I'm Rakage's Anbu. When we realized this, I volunteered to lead the team away from the others so that they could return to our base with the supplies, answered Naruto where he continued on. After a few days I lost the Anbu, but by then I was exhausted, as I hadn't slept for days or had much time to rest and eat and I was a long way from any friendly bases or hideouts. Luckily before I collapsed from exhaustion, I came across a small village, where they hid me from enemy patrols until I recovered. There I also met Nene's and Yoshiko's mother who was the one who found me and took care of me until I fully recovered. The girls were barely four at the time, but I grew quite fond of them during the few days I stayed there. A few months later though, as the war started to turn in our favor. The god I'm Rakage ordered the destruction of every village and town that supported the rebel factions or was believed to be harboring them, hoping to intimidate them into stop supporting us. 
We of course did our best to protect as many villages and towns as we could, but couldn't save them all. The village that the girls were from, was it one of those villages that were destroyed? Asked Eno. Yes, replied Naruto sadly, somehow the god I'm Rakage forces learned that the village had hidden me from them and by the time I arrived, the village had been completely destroyed and the villagers slaughtered. When we searched the ruins of the village for any survivors, we only found the girls, who were crying underneath the ruins of their house. Their mother had used a trapdoor in their house to hide them from the god I'm Rakage's men, before they killed her. Soon after finding them, I decided to adopt them, as they had no other family left. Their father had been killed shortly after the civil war started, just after they had been born, when he tried to stop the former Lightning Daimyo's men from confiscating the village's grain supply. After hearing this, the mood of most of the two groups became somber, given how much Nene and Yoshiko lost because of the civil war in Kaminari no Kuni. They also knew, that Naruto most likely blamed himself for what happened to the girl's mother and their village, since in his mind it was his fault, since if he hadn't been in the village, it might have been spared. And what about your other daughter Yami, was she from the same village as well? Asked Kiba. No, Yami wasn't from the Nene's and Yoshiko's village, although I did adopt her not long after I adopted Nene and Yoshiko, answered Naruto. So why did you adopt her? asked Kankuro. At this question an unreadable look appeared on Naruto's face, where none of the members of the two groups could figure out what Naruto was thinking at that moment. I'm afraid I cannot answer that question, replied Naruto. Since not only is it a rather sensitive and personal question, but also classified. Naturally at hearing this, the two groups became even more curious about Yami's past. Since the young girl was a curious enough person, given the way she acted towards people and how she remained almost completely expressionless, like a doll or something. Do they know that they're adopted? Asked Choji. Yes they do, as like I said earlier, I've no secrets from them, answered Naruto, after which he stated that they should get back to business and finish their earlier discussion. Gara and Sunid and the others of course knew that Naruto was purposely changing the subject of their conversation away from girls but they decided to not comment on it and complied with Naruto's wish. After a quick discussion on where and how the talks were going to happen, the meeting ended, where Naruto told them that if they were still interested in the tour of the village, it would begin at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning and that they would be accompanied by the Mizukage and her party. Nodding their heads in thanks and stating that they be there, the two cages left the room with their individual parties. The next day conference room in the Reikage's Tower, Mountain. Currently sitting at a large table in the conference room, Naruto was patiently waiting for the representative of Iwa with his bodyguard wife Yugito and Shinmanuki, the Chi no Megami, goddess of earth, and member of the Go Genso no Megami, the five elemental goddesses. Like many of Naruto's subordinates and followers, Uki was not from either New Kumo or Kaminari no Kuni, lightning country, she was in fact from Iwa herself. Uki was from a well-respected family of Shinobi, where her father held a seat as a Jonan commander in the Iwa council. When Ryoku took power from the Sandaim Suchikage, Uki's father was one of the few people who openly opposed Ryoku's rule and tried to find proof that he was behind the death of the Sandaim Suchikage, who was said to have died due to heart failure not long after he was forced to surrender his position as Suchikage. Naturally when Ryoku learned of this, he hired an outside group to kill her entire family and blamed it on foreign shinobi. He then later discredited her family, stating that they were working with outside forces to overthrow Niwa, but were betrayed themselves by their allies. Fortunately Uki was able to escape the slaughter of her family, along with her younger sister and thanks to help to some friends of her father, they were able to leave the village and country without being discovered. After traveling for some time, Uki knew she and her sister needed to join a new village, which could protect them from Ryoku's followers who would come after them. Naturally she knew she couldn't go to Suna and Kanoa given their past history with her village and Kiri was too far away. So she decided to join New Kumo, given how she had heard that the civil war had just ended at the time and that they would need more shinobi to replace their losers. When she first met Naruto and learned who he really was, Uki had naturally become fearful of what he might do, given how she and her sister were from the village that was his father's sworn enemy. But fortunately, her fears had been proven wrong, where Naruto accepted her without incident and gave her a chance to prove herself, where she became a loyal shinobi for New Kumo. Uki was tough, assertive person who was not afraid to speak her mind. But at the same time had a very compassionate side, which she showed mainly to her younger sister. 
She was a woman of action and would often be in the front lines of any battle and proved herself to be a skilled user in Doten Jutsu, which resulted in her becoming the Chi no Megami of the Go Genso no Megami. She also had a very loyal spirit, which she had proven on many missions for New Kumo, where she saved the lives of many of her comrades at the risk of her own life. Yet she also had a mild tendency to hold grudges, especially when it came to the Yondime Tsuchikage Ryoku and his family. Uki had short brown hair and brown eyes and an average-looking face. She wore a heavily armored green kimono, making her look almost like some kind of samurai. Eventually after a few minutes, the Iwa party entered the room. The main representative of Iwa was none other than Kokimi. Daughter of the former Yondaim Choikikage Ryoku and sister to the current Godaim Choikikage Beragu and was accompanied by two Iwa Jonan. Kokimi was extremely attractive woman, with dark violet hair with hairpins in it. She wore a purple and black elegant, yet slightly revealing kimono that showed off her figure. When Naruto saw Kokimi and her party enter the room, he raised his guard. As he had done his homework on Kokimi, who according to Uki's and Masato's head of CIND division reports, she was a highly intelligent and cunning person and was equally ambitious. She was also said to be a very good manipulator and a skilled diplomat. Yet as skilled as she was in diplomacy, she was twice as deadly in battle, as she was extremely deadly in the art of assassination and was highly skilled in combat and in using genjutsu and poisons. It was even rumored among the higher-ups in Iwa, that she had been the one who killed the Sandime Suchikage by poisoning him. It is a pleasure to finally meet you Reikage sama I've heard a great deal about you, said Kokimi as she walked over to Naruto, who stood up from his seat and shook her hand. The pleasure is mine Kokimi-san, I've been looking forward to our meeting for some time, replied Naruto. After which Kokimi smiled and nodded, where she shook hands with Naruto. It was then at this point, that she finally took notice of Uki, who was standing next to Naruto, and quickly recognized her, where she narrowed her eyes ever so slightly. Eventually though, Kokimi let go of Naruto's hand and went over to the other end of the table and took the seat there. I must admit I was rather surprised when I first received your message calling for a ceasefire and asking for peace Kokimi-san, given how I killed your father, said Naruto. I believe you're mistaken Reikage sama although my father received serious injuries from his battle with you, he is still alive and is recovering. Also it was he not I who asked for the ceasefire, responded Kokimi. Please Kokimi-san let us not start off with lies already and do not treat me like a fool. I know your father is dead or at the very least, is in a state where he can no longer rule your village. The injuries he received from battling me would have been too extensive for him to survive and even if by some miracle he survived. The damage from my futon, raisin shuriken wind style, spiraling shuriken alone, would have crippled him to the extent where he could no longer use his chakra or be a shinobi. At hearing this, Kokimi frowned slightly, since she hadn't expected Naruto to know that her father was dead. As she had hoped to keep her father's death hidden from everyone for a while, so that Iwa would look stronger than it really was. Also, continued Naruto, your father would never have wanted to make peace with me, since I'm the living reminder of my father, who he despises more than anyone else. He said as much, when we fought one another and he would not rest until either one of use was dead. Kokimi of course frowned further when she heard this, and silently cursed her now deceased father. She thought about denying it and trying to convince Naruto that her father was still alive, but knew it would be futile. I apologize for my deception Reikage sama but I'm sure you of all people can understand that to protect one's homeland, you need to be deceptive at times. Yes I do understand, which is why I will look past the matter, replied Naruto. I'm very pleased to hear that Reikage sama since the first great shinobi world war and your surprise attack on our forces. There has never been a major conflict between out separate villages and it would a great tragedy for both sides for another conflict to erupt, stated Kokimi. Do not try and make us as the guilty party for attacking your forces, since we aren't the first to do something like that and we certainly won't be the last. Besides Iwa itself is guilty for attacking suddenly without warning, or are you forgetting the Claw Valley incident in Hon no Kuni, Bone County, 5, stated Yugito rather angrily, as she heard the underlying remark in Kokimi words. At the mention of the Claw Valley incident Kokimi remained expressionless, although silently cursed herself for forgetting that incident. The incident itself was well known, since it was the closest time since the First Great Shinobi World War that Kumo and Iwa came to war. During the Third Great Shinobi World War, both villages were involved in a separate war with Kanoa. 
At the time Kumo was battling Kanoa's forces along Hai no Kuni, Fire Country, Northern Borders, while Iwa was fighting Kanoa in Kusa no Kuni, Grass Country. After the destruction of Kanabi Bridge, six Iwa attempted a daring maneuver to win the war, where they sent a massive army numbering about 10,000 shinobi across Taki no Kuni, Waterfall Country and into Hon no Kuni. The plan was to enter Hon no Kuni and cross the border between it and Hai no Kuni and head straight for Kanoa, bypassing its main forces and destroy the village with one massive attack. At the same time, the Sandime Rakage, who was leading a platoon of Kumo Shinobi, who to many was known as Fumitsu, the immortal, due to his body incredible durability, which some called the perfect shield, was returning to Kumo from making a successful raid on several Kanoa bases in Hai no Kuni. Wanting to avoid being ambushed by Kanoa forces, the Sandime Rakage and his shinobi took the long way back to Kanoa, where they made their way to Hon no Kuni and planned to make their way back to Kumo from there. By nightfall the Sandime Rakage and his men crossed the border between Hai no Kuni and Hon no Kuni and made their way into Claw Valley. There they encountered several Iwa teams, who were sent ahead of the main force to scout things out. When the Iwa teams came across the Sandime Rakage and his shinobi, they mistook them for Kanoa shinobi and attacked them. Soon after their attack, the main Iwa forces arrived. By the time the Iwa commander realized the mistake that had been made, he could not stop the battle as the Sandime Rakage and his shinobi began attacking the rest main force. Believing that the Iwa force had purposely ambushed them, in an attempt to kill the Rakage and weaken Kumo. When daybreak broke and the Kumo Nin saw the force they were up against. The Sandime Rakage order what was left of his platoon to retreat, while he acted as a rear guard and held back the Iwa army, knowing that they could not win against such overwhelming numbers. Despite being hopelessly outnumbered, the Sandime Rakage fought heroically and did the impossible, and held back the massive army of Shinobi for three consecutive days and nights without halt, before collapsing and dying from exhaustion. This resulted in the Sandime Rakage being praised not only as a hero of Kumo, but also as the greatest Rakage to have lived, for single-handedly holding back an entire army. Soon after the battle ended, the Iwa commander ordered his force to return home, given the losses they suffered and how they no longer had the element of surprise on their side. As Kanoa quickly became aware of the enemy army not long after the battle started and once the battle ended, they were prepared to counter the army. After the battle, tensions between Kumo and Iwa rose, but before a war could erupt, both sides signed a peace treaty. As neither side wanted to fight the other, given how they were both fighting a separate war with Kanoa and feared if war erupted between the two. One of them would make peace with Kanoa and ally with it and sooner and destroy the other or Kanoa and sooner would simply call back their forces and let the two fight it out and take advantage of their weakened states later on. With all due respect, replied Kokimi as she turned to Yugito, that was a tragic mistake. It was never our intention to attack the Sandime Rakage and his party and our forces paid for that mistake, as we lost many our finest shinobi in that battle. That may be true, but it does not change the fact that our village lost one of its greatest leaders because of an unprovoked attack by your shinobi, spoke Yugito rather angrily. Since even today, there were still some hard feels among new Kumo shinobi towards Iwa. Who like Yugito regard the Sandime Rakage as a hero of Kumo. Before Kokimi could respond to this, Naruto intervened, saying that they were here to talk and make peace, not to fight or start another war. At this remark, both women nodded in agreement, but not before they glared at one other for a minute or two. For the next few hours, Naruto and Kokimi discussed the terms and details of the peace treaty. As expected, Kokimi proved that she was a skilled diplomat, where she was able to skillfully avoid falling into Naruto's trap, where he tried to restrict her village's fleet movement, which was currently being rebuilt. She was even able to maneuver herself to become the new ambassador for her village and be given residence in New Kumo. Since following one of the terms that Naruto agreed to earlier on, Iwa would be allowed an ambassador in his village to represent it, so that both villages could better communicate with one another. Naturally Naruto couldn't refuse her, since she had the right to choose who would represent her village, even if that person was herself. But still it did present the opportunity for her to be used a political hostage should the alliance and Iwa go to war again. But as skilled as Komiki was, Naruto was still able to force some restrictions on Iwa. Like preventing them from rebuilding their fleet to its original size, which was 150, and restricting them from only having 30 ships. He was also able to force Iwa to abandon and dismantle all their major bases and forts along the borders of any alliance member.
so in the event of another war between them, Iwa would be unable to launch any major invasion on any member nation or village of Heavenly Alliance. It would also severely weaken any kind of first line of defensive for them, should they be invaded by the Alliance. I'm afraid that I must refuse your request Kokimi-san, replied Naruto rather coolly, after hearing Kokimi's latest request, which she suggested under the guise of improving relations between Alliance and Iwa. I do not see problem Reikage sama Uki-san's sister is a citizen of my village and Uki-san herself is a former shinobi and she is wanted for conspiring with her family to overthrow my father. Surely as sign of goodwill, you will hand her over to my village, stated Kokimi. At this, Uki slowly started to growl, as her temper began to rise, but before she could say or try anything, Naruto stopped her by raising his hand. I'm afraid even if your claims were true Kokimi-san, I will not hand over either Uki or her sister to your village. Uki is a valuable shinobi to my village and her sister is about to become one herself and I will not hand them over to be tortured and executed, even if it was for better relations between our separate villages. But surely Reikage sama you can see the value of handing over Uki-san at least. As it would go a long way to mending relationships with our villages. I can also assure you, that Uki-san will be given a fair trial and if found innocent, she will be returned to your village if she wishes to. I still must refuse your request Kokimi-san, as when Uki-san and her sister first came to my village. I agreed to give them sanctuary in my village and I never go back on my word and there is not a thing you or your village can do to force me to hand them over to you. Nor do I believe that your village is willing to start a war over this, stated Naruto. Well if you're unwilling to hand over Uki-san and her sister. Perhaps, there is another way that could mend our village's relations with one another, suggested Kokimi, as she maintained a blank face. And that would be, asked Naruto, knowing that he probably not liked the answer. We would like a written apology signed by you, for attacking our forces. An apology, repeated Naruto with a raised eyebrow. Yes, I don't believe that much to ask for replied Kokimi, with a small smirk indicating she was up to something. But Kokimi-san, it was war and in war people fight and die. I'm aware of that rakage sama but our two nations weren't at war with one another and there are many in my village, who feel that your attacks were unwarranted. But should you give a written apology for attacking our forces, I'm sure that it would go a long way of mending the wounds between our two villages, answered Kokimi with an all-too-sweet smile. I'm afraid an apology is not possible Kokimi-san, said Naruto calmly without giving anything away. And may I ask why? Surely it's not about pride. Since you made a point to acknowledge that the incident involving the Hyuga clan was entirely your village's fault, and openly apologized for it and even paid the clan compensation. Certainly not, the reason I cannot apologize is simply because of this. Said Naruto as he took out a medium-sized folder from his inside pocket coat and slide it across the table to Kokimi, who pick it up. What is it? This folder is one of several that my shinobi found in a recent raid on one of Orokimaru's bases. This folder describes in detail a joint attack on our neighbors, you know Sato Hot Spring Country, and Shimo no Kuni, Frost Country, by Kiri, Oto and Iwa once Kanoa was destroyed. It also goes on to detail that after the countries are invaded, they are to be used as staging points for a massive invasion on my village. The reason why I'm showing you this folder is that it is specifically linked to your village, as this was planned by your father. I'm disappointed Rakage sama I would have expected better from you than fabricating evidence to justify your unwarranted attack on our forces. Even if this folder wasn't fabricated the fact that you found it in Orokimaru's base should indicate that he was the architect of the plan, not my father. There is no proof that my father was behind the creating of this plan or had any knowledge of it whatsoever or even supported it. For all we know, Orokimaru planned this himself, believing he could convince my father and the others into attacking your alliance after Kanoa was destroyed. Oh I can assure you this is authentic and it was indeed formed by your father, for if you look to the last page you'll see your father's signature and the stamp of the Tsuchikij on it. When Kokimi turned to the last page, she did indeed find her father's signature and the stamp of the Tsuchikij at the end of the last page. This proved without a doubt, that her father was indeed the architect of this plan against the Heavenly Alliance. When she saw this, Kokimi had to bite down her own frustration, as she never expected Naruto to actually find proof that her father was indeed planning to attack the Heavenly Alliance with Orokimaru and the others. 
As you can see, apologizing for my attack on your forces would be pointless, as this proves that my village was acting in the defense of the Heavenly Alliance. It seems that I am the one who owes you an apology Reikage Sama, apologized Kokimi. I had no idea that my father was planning to attack the Heavenly Alliance with Orokimaru and the others. Naruto of course didn't believe a word that Kokimi said, since he found it highly unlikely that that Kokimi didn't know what her father had planned. That quite all right Kokimi-san, replied a smiling Naruto, who was enjoying his little victory over Kokimi. But still in the name of mending fences, perhaps you could send us a written apology for planning to attack the alliance. At the mention of this, Naruto was gratified to see a slight twitch on Kokimi's face, before she smiled, which was clearly forced, and said, of course Reikage Sama. I'm pleased to hear that, now if it all right with you, I would like to end the talks early today, since I've a very important event that I must attend. Yes, I believe that would be a splendid idea, replied Kokimi, with another forced smile, before bidding Naruto a good day. Once Kokimi left the room, Uki and Yugito turned and smiled at the blonde Reikage. Well played Reikage Sama, said Uki, who had enjoyed seeing Kokimi being caught off guard and being put in her place for once. Agreed, you sure showed her who was in charge here, said Yugito with her own smile. But I still don't understand why we're so eager to get you to sign that apology, it's not like it could really hurt us. Maybe not physical, but if I had agreed to sign a written apology it would have caused us a great deal of political problems further down the road, answered Naruto. What do you mean by that? asked Yugito. What Kokimi's real objective was, to have us admit that our attack on their forces was unwarranted, explained Naruto. By writing up this apology and signing it, Iwa would have written proof of us admitting that the actions we took against their village was uncalled for and unprovoked. This would then give them a great deal of political leverage to use against us. They could even use this apology to get the other nations and shinobi villages, who are not allied to us, to side with them against us at another time, when they are ready. Since the apology could be used to convince those nations and villages, that we will attack anyone who does not stand with the Heavenly Alliance. At hearing this both Uki and Yugito frowned, as they had no idea how a simple written apology could do so much damage in the wrong hands. It seems that she is more cunning than I gave credit for, commented Uki, where Naruto just nodded in agreement. But how did you know that she would try something like this? Asked Yugito. Well it was pretty obvious that Iwa would try and use our sudden attack on their forces to try and gain some kind of advantage or compensation in the talks. That why I had Mitsuhide and the other groups that were attacking Orokimaru's bases, to look out for these files or something to prove that Iwa and the others were going to attack us. It was only a stroke of good fortune that these files arrived before the talks. But even if you hadn't these files, you still could have refused to give a written apology, since we knew they were planning to attack us from the beginning, stated Yugito. At this, Naruto just shook his head, if I had refused, Iwa would still have used our sudden attack on them to gain sympathy from other nations and villages, who aren't with us. Even if we said that Iwa and the others were planning to attack us, it would be simply our word against theirs. This would then make us look like villains and them victims, where they would slowly manipulate other nations and villages to siding against us. By playing on their fears of our growing power and being invaded and stating that it would only be a matter of time before we start invading all the other nations that aren't with the alliance. You've thought this through, stated Yugito. I've had to, since despite our growing strength and recent position as the strongest force on the continent. The Heavenly Alliance is only in its infancy, as it is only a few years old, which means it is still fragile and can easily break from one careless mistake. That's why we have to be careful with every decision we make. Then why are you letting her stay here in New Kumo, asked Uki, as she didn't like the idea of Kokimi staying in New Kumo, knowing she would cause her new home trouble. I've no choice, since I agreed earlier to allow both of us to pick whoever we wanted to be the ambassador to our villages, explained Naruto. I just never expected her to pick herself. But still, continued Naruto, there is some advantage to having her here, we can slowly feed her false intel on New Kumo and if war should break out again between us and Iwa, she could be a useful political hostage. Also to quote Sun Tzu, there is wisdom in keeping your friends close and your enemies closer. At this Yugito and Uki nodded, after which Naruto told Yugito and Uki that they should get going or they would be late, where the two women just nodded again and left the room with Naruto. Earlier this morning with the Kanoa group. 
Currently waiting in the hotel lobby to escort the Kanoa, Suna and Kiri groups on their tour of New Kumo, were Uzumaki Kisaragi Yafi, Uzumaki Tatara Tomo, Uzumaki Ayane and Hayabusa Kasumi. With them as well were Killer B's former students Karui, Omoi and Samui, as well as veteran John and Darui and C. When the three groups arrived, the Kiri group were surprised at meeting several more of Naruto's wives. Kanoa and Suna groups although weren't as surprised, since they already knew Yafi and Tomo, who were with Naruto at the Battle of Kanoa. But they were surprised in meeting Ayane and learning she was another of Naruto's wives. As always, Jiraiya started to ogle at the young women in front of him, or more especially at Samui, Ayane and Kasumi and their impressive busts, which rivaled Sunid's. This of course resulted in Sunid bashing him head first into a nearby wall, after which she apologized and promised to pay for the damage. But was quickly told by Ayane that there was no need, since if Sunid hadn't done it, she would have, which of course made the female cage smile and start to like Ayane. Also joining the group was Anko and Aiko, who had been staying in the hotel since they arrived and were eager to see more of New Kumo. Once everyone had arrived, Sunid turned to Tomo, who was leading the New Kumo escort. Now that we are all here, shall we begin the tour? Not just yet Hokage Sama, as we are still expecting one other shinobi who will be assisting us in escorting you around New Kumo, and here she is, said Tomo. Before she turned around to see another shinobi enter the room. When the groups looked up to see who had entered the lobby, many of them were shocked to see, that the person was none other than the former lieutenant of Orokimaru, Gurun. They were even more surprised to see that she now wore a Kumo headband. What the hell is she doing here? declared Sakura angrily, as she and several other members of the Kanoa group took up fighting stances when they saw Gurun. Fortunately before anything could happen Tomo placed herself between Gurun and the Kanoa members and held out her right arm in front of the Kanoa nins. That is enough, there will be no fighting here, if you attack Gurun-san the talks between Kanoa and the Heavenly Alliance will be cancelled and you and your people will be sent back home. But she is one of Orokimaru's followers stated Kiba angrily, as he glared at the former Oto Kanosihi. That is no longer the case, in return for valuable information on Orokimaru and his organization. The Rakage has granted Gurun San amnesty for her past crimes as a member of Otogaku Hidden Sound, as well as allowed her to become a shinobi of New Kumo. After hearing this, the Kanoa, Kiri and Suna groups were surprised, since it was one thing to give amnesty for a former enemy shinobi in return for information but it was a completely separate matter to allow said shinobi to become a member of your village. Many of the Kanoa members of course, could not help but wonder what exactly did Naruto do to Gurun to get her to betray Orokimaru. Since according to the reports they had on her, she had been fanatically loyal to Orokimaru, to the point where she would have gladly died for him. Once the excitement of Gurun new allegiance died down a bit, Ayane suggested that they began the tour of new Kumo, which the three groups quickly agreed to. As the large group was shown around the different areas of the civilian district, many of the Kanoa members were still curious as to why Gurun switched sides. Some like Danzo guessed that she did it for survival, knowing that she would most likely be killed for what she knew. While others, like Koharu thought that she was only pretending to switch sides and was waiting for the right moment to make her escape and return to her master. Eventually Kakashi decided to ask Gurun the question that most of the members of the three groups were thinking. Excuse me Gurun-san, but if you don't mind me asking, why exactly did you betray Orokimaru and join the Rakage? At this question Gurun just smiled and said, to put it simply Hatakai-san, the Rakage can be a rather persuasive. Flashback. Currently sitting in a small unground windowless room, Gurun sat chained to a small chair and table that were nailed to the floor. The chains themselves had specialized seals carved into them, which suppressed her chakra and prevented her from using her bloodline. When Gurun woke up from her drug-induced coma, she found herself in a large unground prison. It of course didn't take a genius to figure out that she had been captured by New Kumo, given how she was chained up and had been defeated by the commander of the shock division Swafon, who also happened to be married to the Rakage. About a week after waking up Gurun was brought out of her cell by two guards and into the room she was in now, which was clearly some kind of interrogation room. Eventually the door to the room opened and a tall man entered the room. He short bright blonde hair that was slicked back by gel or something, so that it was spiked up at the back and had bright blue highlights in the shape of lightning bolts, which traveled up the spike ends of his hair. 
The man also wore a blue long coat with white lightning-like pattern on the right side of the coat and wore a pair of black fingerless gloves and carried a medium-sized book in his right hand. Once Gurren saw the man, she instantly recognized him from old photos she has seen of the man, although his outfit hand and his hairstyle had changed, there was no mistaking it. The Yondaim Hokage muttered Gurren in surprise, at seeing the legendary Shinobi, who led Kanoa to victory in the Third Great Shinobi World War and was known throughout the Shinobi world as Kiroi Senko, Yellow Flash. I'm afraid not, my name is Uzumaki Naruto, replied Naruto coolly, as she sat down in the chair in front of Gurren. Uzumaki, relied Gurren is surprise, but you're supposed to be dead, afraid not, for as you can see, I'm alive and well and before you ask, the reason why I look like the Yondime Hokage is because I'm his son. His son, repeated Gurren is disbelief, where Naruto just nodded. For the next few minutes Gurren remained silent as she tried to adjust to this new information, as she couldn't believe that the Jinchuriki that Kanoa banished over 10 years ago was in fact the son of the Yondime Hokage and was now the Rokudime Rakage. Eventually though, the information settled and as she thought about it more, it slowly made sense, since Orokimaru had once told her. There was an unspoken tradition between the shinobi villages, where a Jinchuriki would be related in some way to the leader of the village. But even with that matter settled, she still found it hard to believe that Naruto was the infamous Rokudime Rakage or as he was more commonly known as the Raiden no Kami, god of thunder and lightning. She especially found it hard to believe that someone like him could be someone so powerful, as she remembered the power Naruto emanated during the Battle of Kanoa. Even if he was the Jinchuriki of the Kyubi no Yokai, Nine-Tailed Demon Fox, it didn't make any sense to her, since she never felt any of the Biju's chakra when he was powering up or battling Orokimaru. Another reason why it didn't make any sense was because according to Kabuto and Orokimaru, the Jinchuriki of the Kyubi was a talentless, loud-mouthed simpleton, who had more guts than brains or common sense. Soon enough though, Gurun was brought out of her train of thought, when Naruto coughed loudly to gain her attention. Ahum, if you're ready Gurun san we shall begin with your interrogation. Wait, you're interrogating me? asked Gurun, when Naruto just nodded. Well this is certainly an ego boost, having the infamous Raiden no Kami interrogating little old me, Gurun said with an arrogant smirk. Naruto of course did not respond to this remark and remained silent and stared at the woman. You might as well just kill me now, as I will tell you nothing about Orokiamru sama and I would sooner die than betray him. Really and what has Orokimaru done for you to deserve such loyalty? He saved me from those who shunned me and made them pay for what they did to me. He also made me more powerful than I ever would have become without him and gave me a purpose for living. At hearing this remark, Naruto maintained a neutral face, preventing Gurun from guessing what he was thinking. So if he asked you to become his new vessel you would agree without hesitation. Of course, that's why I'm one of his most trusted subordinates and it would be my honor to do so, replied Gurun with a sneer. If that is true then why did he not make you his new vessel long ago? He had plenty of opportunities, Naruto answered. It's not my place to question Orokimaru sama he has his reasons. Gurun responded. If you ask me, I think the reason why he never made you his vessel, is because you no longer interest him and as far he was concerned you were nothing more than a disposable tool to him. He cares more about Sasuke and his Sharingan than he does you. At this remark, a low growl could be heard coming from Gurun, as she glared angrily at the blonde rakage. Don't you dare insult Orokimaru sama you're nothing more than trash compared to him. Really, so it would surprise you to hear, that trash like me, sent him slithering back to whatever rock he crawled out of, with tail between his legs. You're lying, there's no way Orokimaru could lose to you. It's true, your forces have been wiped out, most of your allies have either surrendered or have been conquered by us, including Oto no Kuni, Sound Country, or should I say Ta no Kuni, Rice Field Country, since it's returning to its original name. 7. I don't believe, said Gurun, as she refused to believe that Orokimaru had been defeated by Naruto or that Oto had fallen. It's true, as if I wasn't I wouldn't be standing here. Even if what you say is true, I will not tell you anything, I'll never betray Orokimaru sama Really even if it's to help Yukimaru, the one person that you actually care for? Asked Naruto. What? Cried Gurun angrily. You heard me, Yukimaru, the young boy who you've taken into your care. My forces captured him when we attacked one of your bases in Tano Kuni. 
I don't believe you, replied Gurren, as she was certain that Naruto was bluffing and that he only knew about Yukimaru because of one of the Oto Shinobi prisoners he took talked. Since it was no great secret that that she cared for Yukimaru, which was also the reason why no one ever tried to harm the boy, for fear of earning Gurren's wrath. Really, and what if I were to show you this? Asked Naruto he took out a crystallized flower from his coat pocket, would you believe me? When Naruto showed Gurren the crystallized flower, the blue-haired Kunoiki instantly recognized it, as the one she gave to Yukimaru long ago as a gift. You son of a bitch! roared Gurren as she lunged at Naruto, who remained perfectly calm and still, as the chain that bound her to the chair and table, kept her from reaching him. If you've harmed so much as one hair on Yukimaru's head, I'll kill you. Even if is the last thing I do. I suggest that you calm down Gurren San, Yukimaru is perfectly fine, as unlike what some people in Kanoa would tell you. I am no monster and I do not harm innocent people to get what I want, Naruto stated, while secretly pleased that the first phase of his plan had worked. At hearing this, Gurren slowly started to calm down, although continued to glare at the blonde Uzumaki. Once Gurren had calmed down, Naruto then continued to speak to the Shoten user. Now as I was about to say, obviously you care a great deal about the young man, 8, and he cares a great deal about you as well and you would want him to be both safe and happy. So it would be in his best interest that you tell me everything I want to know about Orokimaru, stated Naruto. Or what? Asked Gurren, you said so yourself that you won't hurt innocent people and Yukimaru has done nothing wrong. That is true, and because of that I cannot detain him for long, but he cannot stay in my village and roam it freely either. Since he was once part of your organization and he refuses to answer any of our questions, which might make me reconsider my decision in allowing him to stay. That is why I would have no choice but to send him out of my village, explained Naruto. And once he leaves my village he'll have no money, no food and no shelter. He'll be all alone and there'll be no one to protect him from people, who have been hurt or had people close to them hurt by Orokimaru and his followers like you Gurren San. You bastard. Why Ukimaru had nothing to do with those things. He's innocent. Yelled Gurren. Perhaps, but I'm sure like me, you can understand how deep some people's hatred can run, where it won't matter to them whether he had a hand in the things that Orokimaru and others like you did. All that will matter to those people is that, he was a member of Otogaku. At hearing this, Gurren glared with utter rage at Naruto, where if looks could kill, the young Rakage would be a smoking crater right now. When Naruto saw this, he knew he was getting close and just needed to push a little further. Maybe before he leaves, I'll also tell him the truth behind what happened to his mother and how you killed her after she helped save your life. As soon as Naruto has mentioned Yukimaru's mother, Gurren's eyes widen in shock, where all of the color drained from her face. HH ho how do you know Arab about that? You'd be surprised at how much I know Gurren San and I know for certain that this news would be quite devastating to that you man, since he considers you like a mother. But if you tell me what I want, I will never breathe a word of it to him or anyone else. Bastard, muttered Gurren angrily as she glared at Naruto, and struggled what to do, as on one hand she was loyal to Orokimaru. But on the other hand she cared for Yukimaru and what happened to him and didn't want the truth of what she did to his mother revealed at least not until she herself was ready to tell him of what she had done. Seeing that Gurren had still not decided what to do and was struggling with her loyalty to Orokimaru, Naruto frowned slightly and decided to move to the second phase of his plan. I don't know why you are heisting so much. The choice should be simple enough, you either choice Yukimaru or Orokimaru. Although personally I don't see why you're so loyal to a man like Orokimaru, who doesn't deserve anyone's loyalty to begin with. He demands everything from you and expects you to do whatever he says without question and yet he shows no concern or loyalty to you in return. Don't you dare speak of Orokimaru sama like that, you wouldn't understand why I would give my life for him Gurren retorted. Oh I understand better than you might think, for most of your childhood you were shunned and hated by your village, because they feared what you could do. They treated you like an outcast or some kind of disease, saying how they would all be better off if you were dead and how you were some kind of monster. Then one day, Orokimaru came along, he punished those who scorned you and was the first person to truly acknowledge you. He then took you in and made you feel special and helped you gain power that you never had before, he made you feel strong. 
how did you? said Gurun in surprise, but could not find the words to finish, since Naruto had described her childhood perfectly. Like I said, you'd be surprised of what I know. Besides I'm Jinchuriki, so I know a thing or two about what it is like to be shunned and hated by people for something that you've no control of. I can also tell by looking at a person, if they've gone through the similar kind of life that I went through, since the emotional scars from back then, never truly go away. At this remark Gurun remained silent, as she didn't know how to respond to that. Regardless of what Orokimaru has done for you in the past, he doesn't care about you. The only person that he cares about is himself. Once he is finished with you or you're no longer any use to him, he'll throw you away, just like Kimimaro, said Naruto, where at the mention Kimimaro, Gurun looked up at Naruto is surprise. If you still don't believe me, take a look at this, stated Naruto as he hand Gurun the book that he had been carrying since he entered the room. What is this? It's one of Orokimaru's journals, we found it when we raided one of his bases in Tano Kuni, go to page 74, it has something you should be very interested in, answered Naruto. As Gurun looked over the book, she glanced through some of the pages, where they mentioned different types of experiments and plans Orokimaru had done. The dates on the entries indicated that the journal was at least a few years old, which Orokimaru must have forgotten about in one of his bases, after it was filled. When she finally reached the page that Naruto told her to go, she was shocked to learn that Orokimaru had planned to have Yukimaru killed, since he was no use to him, as the Akatsuki had captured the Sanbi three tails. But as she read on, she learned that Orokimaru later changed his mind. As he saw how close she, Gurun, was to Yukimaru and planned to use him as leverage, in the event that she ever disobeyed him Orokimaru or tried to leave Oto. Naturally Gurun tried to deny this evidence, stating that it was a fake, but could not, as she recognized her master's handwriting. Also some of the things mentioned in the journal could only be known by Orokimaru. Not to mention, it would not be unlike her master to plan such a thing, as he had done so before. When he learned that she let Yukimaru's mother go after she saved her life. He ordered her to kill Yukimaru's mother to prove her loyalty and commitment to him. Natural she had done it, but it was a decision that came back to haunt her many times, especially whenever she looked at Yukimaru. Seeing Gurun's resolve breaking, Naruto decided to make his final move. As you can see, you owe Orokimaru nothing, as like everyone else he used you. Now I ask you again, will you tell me everything you know about Orokimaru and his organization? Gurun did not answer Naruto at first and just continued to look at Orokimaru's journal and at the page that stated that Yukimaru was Orokimaru's insurance over her. Eventually though, she closed the book and stared down at the table, Naruto also noticed at the same time that Gurun tightened her fist in anger. As if she was enraged at what her former master had planned to do or was struggle with what to do. Seeing this Naruto was about to ask Gurun again, but before he could, Gurun suddenly spoke. If I give you what you want, what exactly will happen to Yukimaru? If you agree to help me and tell me everything you know about Orokimaru's organization, including the location of all his bases throughout the continent. I'll give Yukimaru sanctuary here in New Kumo and I will see to it personally, that he is given citizenship in Kaminari no Kuni in New Kumo and will be well taken care of. I'll even see to it, that he is allowed to visit you whenever he wants to, but only if what you tell me is true, answered Naruto. And what assurance do I have, that you will hold up your end of the deal? You have my word and if Orokimaru or Kabuto have told you anything about me, it is that I always keep my word no matter what. When Gurun looked up, she stared at Naruto's eyes intently, to see if she could see any deception in them, but could find none. After a minute or two, Gurun let out a sigh and decided to take a chance on Naruto. Fine I tell you everything, replied Gurun and began to tell Naruto about Orokimaru other operations, personal and his bases across the elemental continent. Two weeks later, after being interrogated by Naruto, the next two weeks flew by pretty quickly for Gurun, as Naruto promised. He gave Yukimaru sanctuary in New Kumo and a place to stay and allowed him to visit Gurun for at least an hour each day. Although would hold back on giving Yukimaru citizenship until he made sure that the intel she gave him was creditable. After two weeks, Gurun was brought back into the interrogation room, this time unbounded, when she entered the room she found Naruto waiting patiently for her and holding a small folder in his hand. Hello again Gurun-san, greeted Naruto with a small smile. If you're here, I'm guessing that you validated everything I told you, stated Gurun once she sat down. 
Yes, the intel you gave us was extremely useful. We are now preparing to make our move against all of Orokimaru's bases with a multiple simultaneous attack and as promised, here is Yukimaru's citizenship form. As of this moment, Yukimaru is a citizen of both Kaminari no Kuni, Lightning Country, and New Kumo and is under our protection, stated Naruto as he showed Gurren, Yukimaru's citizenship form. And what are these other two forms? Asked Gurren as she indicated to two others forms that Naruto took out along with Yukimaru's citizenship form. This first form is your citizenship form, stated Naruto, which surprised the blue-haired Kunoiki, but before she could reply to this, Naruto continued. The second is your shinobi registration form, which will allow you to become a shinobi here. Me, a shinobi here, said Gurren in surprise. Yes, you'll hold the rank of Jonan here in the village and have most of the same privileges, but you will not have the power to order lesser rank shinobi. Your movements will be restricted to this village and even then you won't be allowed in restricted sections of the village. You'll also be monitored at all times by my shinobi until such a time that I deem it unnecessary. So I would leave one prison and enter another, Gurun replied with a slight frown. That is one way of looking at it, but at least you'll have more freedom than you have now and have a chance at a new life here. I've also arranged, in the event that you accept my offer that you'll have an apartment near where Yukimaru is staying, so that you can be close to him. After hearing the Rakage's offer, Gurun raised her eyebrow in some skepticism, since this offer was far too good to be true, hence there had to be some kind of catch to it. And why exactly are you offering me this very generous offer? As I said when we last met Gurun San, I'm a man of my word and I am simply upholding my end of the bargain. Bargain, repeated Gurun in confusion, as she didn't understand what Naruto was talking about. Yes a bargain, before we first met, we interrogated Yukimaru, now as I said before, when we first interrogated him he said nothing. But when we learned how close you and he were from some other Oto prisoners, we struck a deal with him. In return for everything he knew about Orokimaru's other bases. We agreed to not harm you and allowed him to stay here in the village. Wait. You lied to me then, our deal was that in return for the information I gave you, Yukimaru would allow you to stay here, stated Gurren angrily. Yes, I did and I do apologize for that, but it was a necessary part of my test, explained Naruto. Test. Gurren repeated in confusion. Yes a test, after our agreement with Yukimaru, he surprisingly knew more than we expected and even gave us the locations of some bases that we were unaware of. During the course of our interview with him, he told us how you went out of your way to make sure he was well looked after when he was young. As well as how much you seemed to care for him and how you even regretted many the actions you took, while following Orokimaru's orders. Naturally we were skeptical, but decided to test you to see if your remorse and you feelings for Yukimaru were genuine. But Yukimaru, he would have told me something. Said Gurun. He was in on the plan as well, for in return for his cooperation, we agreed that if you passed my test, we would give you sanctuary here. So I'm guessing since you're showing me these forms, that I passed your little test, responded Gurun. Yes, you proved that you generally care for Yukimaru, by the way you reacted when I mentioned Yukimaru and threatened him. You also showed remorse for your past actions when I mentioned Yukimaru's mother and you further proved that you cared for Yukimaru's well-being by telling me the truth about Orokimaru bases and operation. Some of which we already knew from Yukimaru and others, but proved nonetheless that you were being truthful. After hearing this, Gurun could only shake her head in amusement and could not help but be slightly impressed, as Naruto had gotten her to talk, without having to lay a finger on her. And here I thought Orokimaru-sama was the cunning one. Does Yukimaru know about? Gurun asked but found she could not finish her sentence, because of the shame she felt. No he doesn't, I decided that I wouldn't tell him until after I finished testing you and since you passed, I leave that matter entirely up to you, Naruto answered. Thank you, said Gurun with some relief, as she wanted to be the one who told Yukimaru, once she found the courage to tell him. Eventually though, after a few minutes, Gurun decided to ask Naruto something else she had been wondering. I get that you're giving me citizenship here because of the deal you made with Yukimaru. But what I don't understand is why you're giving me the chance to be become a shinobi for you. To put it simply Gurun San, you're a talented shinobi, where even Swafon Chan spoke highly of your skill, which I can assure you is no small feat, since Swafon Chan is not easily impressed. It would also be a regrettable waste of your talents, not to offer you the chance to join New Kumo. 
Now this offer is strictly optional and will not affect our pervious deal with Yukimaru. So basically you want me for my skill and bloodline, replied Gurun. Your skill yes, as for your bloodline that's just an added bonus and to be perfectly frank Gurun san I think you would prefer to remain a shinobi. Since you're not the type of person that would go for civilian life, at least not yet, Naruto explained before smiling. Also you could say I'm a sucker for a good redemption story, where you might be able to do some good with your power, as you would be a welcome and powerful asset to my village. I can also assure you that I will not turn my back on you like Orokimaru, as unlike him, I take care of those who serve under me. What about your people and your shinobi? I doubt all of them will be as understanding as you are and will not like the idea of you making me a shinobi here. I won't deny it may be hard for you for a while, since many will not trust you right away, as trust is earned not given. But they will give you a chance to prove yourself, as the people trust my judgment and once you've earned it, they will welcome you, said Naruto before a hardened look appeared on his face. But let me just warn you Gurun San, should you ever break that trust and betray us, there will be no place where you can hide from us. After hearing this, Gurun had to fight hard to suppress the urge to shiver slightly, as when Naruto made the threat. His eyes began to glow bright blue and he emanated a great deal of power from them, indicating that he was deadly serious about what he said and that he could back up any threat that he made. I understand and I accept your proposal, replied the slightly nervous Shoten user, after which Naruto just nodded. Very good, but before you sign these forms, could you tell me everything else that you know about Orokimaru's organization? What do you mean? I told you everything, replied Gurun, as she tried to mask her surprise. Please Gurun san do not treat me like the fool I used to be when I was young, sated Naruto with a knowing smile. I'm well aware that you held back some of the things that you know about Orokimaru and his other bases, so that you have something to bargain with on the slight chance that I go back on our deal with Yukimaru. Huh, said Gurun with an impressed look, I guess there's nothing you don't miss. I try not to, answered Naruto, after which Gurun filled Naruto on everything else she knew about Orokimaru and his operations, where he then allowed Gurun to sign the citizenship form and the shinobi registration form. After which she became an official kunoiki of New Kumo. End flashback. Kakashi of course tried to ask Gurun to go into further detail, but Gurun refused to state how exactly Naruto got her to join New Kumo. At the same time, the three shinobi elders became concerned of Gurun's newfound allegiance. Since with Gurun now with New Kumo, there was a possibility that New Kumo could get her to build a new shinobi clan in New Kumo with the ability to use the Shoten Crystal Release bloodline. Another reason why they were concerned was because, they all knew how strong Gurun was from the reports they had on her and how she nearly defeated Yamato in the Battle of Kanoa. As the three groups were shown around the civilian district, they visited the different areas and buildings in the district, like the civilian hospitals and schools. During the tour some of the members of the three groups began to converse a little with the members of their escort or more precisely with Naruto's wives Ayane, Tomo and Yuffie and Ayane's half-sister Kasumi. As some of the members of the group conversed with Kasumi, they learned that she came from the Mugen Tenshin clan. After hearing this, Lee immediately became extremely excited, as he had heard of the Mugen Tenshin clan, who were famed for the great taijutsu fighting skill and power in battle, along with the unique ninjutsu. The three groups also learned that Kasumi was the second child and only daughter of the clan head Shidin and that she was married to the head of the Hayabusa clan, Hayabusa Ru who was also the head of Naruto's elite storm division. Kasumi was a slender, physically fit young woman of average height, but with an extremely buxom and had a curvy figure. She had a round face, small facial features and wide, brown eyes, with copper-like hair that went waist-length hair. She wore a black ninja dress with black stockings and gold trimming, detailing with a red obi around her waist and a pair of black arm guards with gold edgings on both her arms and long black sleeves. 10. After talking with Kasumi for a while, the three groups found Kasumi to be an honorable and kind-spirited person, who did not enjoy fighting, despite being a highly skilled kunoiki with deadly abilities. In fact she preferred to live in peace with people, something which Danzo and Koharu found to be naive and foolish, but did not to comment on. Her half-sister Ayane on the other hand was the daughter of the clan head Shiden's wife Ayami, and his brother Reidu who betrayed their kumo long ago and raped Ayami. Like Naruto, Ayane was treated as an outcast by her clan and even the village for being the bastard child of a traitor. Although unlike Naruto, she was lucky enough to have Yugito, her best friend, and Killer B, 
who knew what it was like to be an outcast. Yet despite being treated as an outcast, Ayane proved herself to be a highly gifted shinobi, where she eventually became known as Jose Tengu, female Tengu. Due to her childhood Ayane had a cold-like persona, yet had a strong determination which he grew from the years of being like an outcast in Kumo. Yet she was a proud person and was confident to the point or arrogance of her skill as a kunoiki. When the Kanoa nins tried to talk to her, she treated them with a cold neutrality, which indicated that she did not hold their village in very high regard, whether it was because of their village's former rivalry or because of what Kanoa did to Naruto when he was young. But what the representatives didn't know was that cold persona was keep people from knowing her softer, gentler side, fearing that someone would use it against her if they knew. The only people that knew this side was Naruto and the rest of their family. Ayane was of average height with a slender body, and despite being younger than her sister. She bore the second biggest bust out of all the girls, Simwi being the biggest something that caught the attention of many male members. She wore a purple dress with a black scarf, along with arm and leg warmers with a large pink obi and purple boots and gloves and butterfly brooch and carried two tantos on both her legs sheaths and another one strapped horizontally to her lower back. She had a round face, with a small button nose and wide reddish pink eyes, which gave a cute child-like appearance. Along with straight purple hair, that was cut to the nape of her neck. 11. Tomo was unlike most of Naruto's other wives, she didn't speak much at all to the groups, where they quickly learned that Tomo was the silent type of person. Hence she would only speak if she had to or had something to say someone and had a serious look on her face all the time. That indicated that she was a very serious person, not unlike Shino and the members of Abarane clan. Tomo was a very attractive young woman, with long black hair and an almost angelic-like face. She was also very fit-looking, where she had a slim muscular like build, which was shown well by her tight black tank top and tight-fitting leather pants. She also wore long black leather gloves that went up her arms and thick leather boots with steel tips heels and toes. From what Kasumi, told some of the members, Tomo was one new Kumo's top assassins and kunoikis as well as a member of the Tatara clan and wielded their bloodline coat and steel release. She also happened to be the younger cousin of the current clan head of the Tatara clan, Tatara Hamryo, who Anko and Aruka already had met, as he had saved Aruka from a cursed warrior during Battle of Kanoa. Naturally the members of the shinobi representatives were all highly impressed with Tomo, where Jiraiya thought, you sure can pick them brat. Unlike Ayane or any of the others, the three groups learned that Yuffi was the only member of the escort that wasn't born in either Kumo or Kaminari no Kuni. In fact Yuffie's clan, the Kisaragi clan, weren't even native to Kaminari no Kuni. This was of course no great surprise to the more senior members of the shinobi representatives, who were familiar with the Kisaragi clan. Who were native to the small nation called Wute, which had been conquered by Suchi no Kuni Earth Country several years ago. The Kisaragi clan were a very well-known clan in the shinobi world, who were famed for their ability to summon multiple summonses which were said to be very powerful. This of course surprised the younger members of three groups, Aruka's daughter Aiko even asked pleaded with Yuffi to show her some of her summons. Sadly Yuffi had to deny the young girl, but promised to show some of them later to her, which of course caused young Aiko to cheer loudly. Moving on through the civilian district, the members of the three shinobi groups continued talk with their escorts. As they conversed, the Kanoa members found that out of all of Naruto's wives, Yuffie had the most in common with Naruto in terms of personality or at least how he used to be when he was a genin before he was banished. She was very tomboyish as well as cocky, proud, bashful, as well as very aggressive. She even sometimes referred herself as the Great Ninja Yuffie, and the Single White Rose of New Kumo, during some of her conversation with Sunid or the others. Also like Naruto she had a prankster strike in her, which she showed when she refused to refer to Jiraiya as anything but Erosenen and how during the tour when Kakashi asked where a nearby bathroom was. She led him to the woman's bathroom, which resulted in Kakashi getting his ass handed to him by several angry civilian women and Kunaki. Yet despite her flaws Yuffi proved to be quite clever and cunning, where she caught on to several questions from Danzo and Koharu, which sounded harmless at first but were in fact carefully warded questions that were designed to learn more of the inner workings of New Kumo. In response to these questions, she answered them in a way that didn't reveal what the two elders really wanted to know. After a few hours, the Darui suggested that they take a lunch break. Naturally everyone agreed to this, where Yuffie stated she knew the perfect place to have lunch. 
After walking for a few minutes, the group eventually arrived at the destination, which they found to be a large restaurant that was filled with many people, both shinobi and non-shinobi alike. When the groups entered the restaurant, they were greeted by a person who was familiar to everyone from Kanoa. Welcome to Ichiraku's restaurant, please take a seat and we'll take your order as soon as we can, spoke the young woman who walked up to them. Ayami-chan, cried Konohamaru's surprise, when he saw the young ramen waitress. Konohamaru, everyone it's good to see all of you, greeted the young woman with a kind smile when she saw her old friends from Kanoa. What are you doing here? asked Ino. My dad and I live here now, replied Ayami. You live here now, repeated Choji in surprise, where Ayami just nodded. Troublesome, then that means that, Naruto must have revealed himself to you when he first came to Kanoa, stated Shikiyamaru. Since after the first talks between Kanoa and Naruto ended, Ayami and her father left the village, stating they could no longer stand living in Kanoa. But the truth was that Naruto probably invited them back to New Kumo, making sure that they didn't get caught up in the war between Kanoa and Orokimaru. As he thought about this, Shikamaru slightly scolded himself for not seeing it sooner. Yeah he did and when we arrived here, he went out of his way to build this place for us, replied Ayami. Flashback. If I'm not very much mistaken that is the young Jinchuriki, Uzumaki Naruto, I'm surprised that they would allow a picture of him in your stand like that. Given how he was banished from this village when he was accused of being a threat to it and spoke the rakage but was interrupted by Ayami before he could finish. Naruto was not a threat to anyone. He was a kind, loving and gentle boy who was a loyal shinobi to this village and loved it despite everything they did to him. The only reason he was banished was because of those blind bigotry fools on the council, and the rest of the idiots in here who saw him as a demon just because he had the QB inside him. He was like a little brother to me and I won't let you say th, cried Ayami angrily before she was stopped by her father who then turned to the rakage. Rakage sama please forgive my daughter, she just gets very emotional whenever Naruto is mentioned here as he was very close to us and his death hurts us both deeply. Especially since the villagers here tried to celebrate his death when it was announced and shush, said Tuki before the rakage raised his hand to stop Tuki for apologizing and then spoke. There is no need to apologize Tuki-san as I can understand how your daughter feels and if I did sound like I was insulting him, then I apologize, as it was not what I meant. I was only making a statement that was all, as I'm well aware of the type of person Uzumaki Naruto was, as he was a hero to several key members to the Heavenly Alliance such as Yuki Haru no Kuni, Snow, Spring Country, Takagaku, Hidden Waterfall, as well as our newest candidate to join the Heavenly Alliance Nami no Kuni, Wave Country, and all of them regard him as a hero. I have heard much about him from the leader of Takagaku Shibuki and from Kayuki Sama and I'm glad to see that there are at least some people here who regard him as a hero, spoke the rakage. At this comment both Ayami and Tenchi nodded, after they went back to work, and began to serve the ramen to the young rakage and his party. As they ate, the disguised Naruto turned to Juj Liang. Sensei, please cast over an illusion of us eating ramen, as I don't want anyone eavesdropping on us. At this the famed Namuriru nodded and placed a subtle genjutsu over the ramen stand, without the Anbu or Root agents knowing it, where as far as they and other people were concerned. The new Kumo party were eating ramen. Eventually, once Naruto and the other had finished their ramen, the masked cage looked up at Tenchi and Ayami. Your ramen is even better than I remembered old man, Ayami-chan, complimented Naruto. Har excuse me, asked the confused Tenchi, who was surprised by the rakage suddenly familiarity to him and his daughter, not to mention his comment. At this Naruto just smiled underneath his mask and tilted his cage hat up and pulled his mask down to reveal his face. Yo, long time no see old man, Ayami-chan. Naturally it took a few moments for both Ayami and Tenchi to realize who they were seeing, since Naruto had grown quite a bit and no longer had his whisker-shaped birthmarks. But regardless the two quickly recognized Naruto for who he was by the cheesy smile he was making and the same bright blue eyes. Naruto, cried Ayami before she grabbed hold of Naruto and pulled him over and hugged him tightly and smothering him into her chest. At the same time, Tenchi began to cry before affectionately roughing up Naruto's head, after his cage hate fell off when Ayami pulled him over the counter. Naturally Juj Liang, Sayuri and Mitsuhide smiled at this, since it was obvious that both Ayami and Tenchi cared a lot for Naruto. Yugito on the other hand seemed a little peeved with Naruto being given a face full of Ayami's chest. 
although Killer B muttered slightly at how Naruto got all the luck, while the blonde cage could only think. Damn I army Chan sure has filled out more. Eventually though I army and Tenchi calmed down, where Yugito pulled Naruto away from I army chest and gave him a slightly annoyed glance, which made the young blonde sweat a little. After which Naruto gave both I army a brief rundown of what happened between him and Itachi and Kisum how he faked his death after the battle and how he later became the rakage. Once Naruto had finished telling them what had happened, both the ramen chief and his daughter were shocked beyond words. I still can't believe that you're the rakage of all people. You certainly never cease to surprise me my boy, stated Tenchi with a smile. Are you going to enter the war and help Kanoa Naruto? Asked Ayami. I know you have every right to be angry at it, but there are good people still here like Aruka, Konohamaru, the Hokage and your friends and Orokimaru needs to be stopped. At this Naruto sighed slightly, look Ayami chan I won't deny I have no great love for Kanoa after I was banished and I do still care for some people like you guys who still live here. But I won't ally my village or the Heavenly Alliance with Kanoa, it just gotten too rotten on the inside thanks to people like that bastard Danzo and that old hag Koharu. At this Ayami sighed, but before she could respond to this Naruto continued on. But regardless, I won't let Orokimaru have his way and I won't let Konohamaru, Aruka sensei and all the others pay for what the council did to me. I have a plan and although I can't go into detail right now, I promise you this war will end and Orokimaru and his coalition are going down. After hearing this, both Ayami and Tenchi smiled, since despite how much he had grown and changed over the years, there was still a bit of the old Naruto in this new Naruto. But in order for this plan to work I need both of you to keep quiet about me still being alive and being the rakage, stated Naruto seriously. But what about, the Hokage, Konohamaru and Aruka, they've all been devastated with the news of your death. It would mean the world to them to know that you're just alive, said Ayami, as she had seen firsthand how the new of Naruto's supposed death had affected them. I know, but trust me Ayami-chan, this is for the best, I will eventually reveal myself, I promise. But for my plan to work right, I need them to think I'm still dead, I can't take the chance of people like Orokimaru and Danzo learning that I'm still alive and if my plan works right I can end this war with one move. When Ayami and Tenchi heard this, both were unsure what to think, but after a few minutes, both decided to trust Naruto. Okay Naruto, we'll trust you and keep quiet about this for now, replied Tenchi. Thanks and trust me you won't regret this, now before I go there one other thing I like to ask you both. And what is that? Asked Ayami. I want both of you to come to New Kumo with me. Naruto are you serious? Asked Tenchi is surprise. I am, both of you are like family to me and I don't want anything to happen to either of you and if you come to New Kumo you'll both be safe there I promise, stated Naruto. I don't know Naruto, regardless of our issues with the village, Kanoa is still our home. I understand where you're coming from old man, but trust, you'll be a lot better off in New Kumo than you would be here, since by the time this war is over, Kanoa will be not be in great shape. Beside New Kumo will welcome you both with open arms, of that you can be certain of, said Naruto, before smiling. Not to mention we could really do with a good ramen restaurant after all the bad ramen Hakaku gave us and I can give you the Rakage's seal of approval, where you can expect a lot of business. After several minutes of heavy thought, both Ayami and Tenchi agreed to move to New Kumo. Natural Naruto was pleased to hear this and told them to not to move out for at least a month and a half, so to avoid suspicion from people like Danzo. He also then gave them a note and told them to keep it safe and not let anyone see it and told them that when they left Kanoa and crossed the border into Kaminari no Kuni. They would be found by one of his patrol teams and once they should they showed the patrol the note, they would escort them to New Kumo. Once Naruto finished explaining everything to Ayami and Tenchi, he put his mask and cage hat on told Jujliang to lower the genjutsu over the stand, after which he said bye them both a goodbye and said he see them soon. End flashback. After hearing how Ayami and Tenchi came to be here in New Kumo, Danzo became further frustrated with how Naruto kept getting the better of him. Especially when it was in their own village, since he had made sure his agents followed Naruto, back when he first arrived in Kanoa, when they only knew him as the Rakage. Yet somehow he was able to reveal himself to Ayami and her father without his agents knowing. Even soon it was slightly curious on how Naruto was able to reveal himself to Ayami and her father, without them knowing. 
as when she had Naruto followed by her own agents, they told her all that Naruto and his party did was eat some ramen and then left. So where is your father Ayami-chan? Asked Mogi, who like most other was pleased to see the older girl doing well. Tu-san is in the back with the rest of his chiefs, since as you can see we're quite busy, answered Ayami. Yes I can see that, it seems that you're doing well here, commented Sunid, as she could see over three quarters of the tables in the restaurant were taken. Yea, well as you can guess, having the Rakage's personal approval can do wonders for business here. The place is nearly always full, especially around lunch time, where we can barely keep up with the demand and we're really popular with the shinobi here. We even now do take out for people. Naturally at hearing this most of the Kanoa group were glad to hear that Ayami and her father were doing so well and were happy. Soon enough though, Ayami led the three groups into the remaining free tables, after which she and some other waiters took everyone's orders and brought their meals to them when they were ready. Once the shinobi representatives had eaten their fill, they said goodbye to Aimei and finished off the tour of the civilian district and then made their way to the industrial district. There they were given a brief tour of some of the factories, where they made equipment to increase the speed for constructing buildings, shipbuilding, speeding up farming production and other machinery. Naturally some like Danzo and the others asked to see where they built their airships and other military equipment. But were denied, by their escorted where the John and C stated that those areas were restricted, and they weren't permitted in them yet. Nor were they allowed in the airship's docks, which were located above the village on the sides of the mountains that surrounded New Kumo. Soon after seeing some of the factories, the three groups left the industry district and entered the Shinobi district. After entering the Shinobi district, the tour group headed for the Shinobi district hospital, where all Shinobi were treated. Sunid was naturally impressed with the place. The building itself was easily three times the size of Kanoa's hospital. It had classrooms for medic nins in training, specious rooms with beds for long-term patients as well as state-of-the-art operating rooms and operating theatres that allowed medic nin students to watch operations. Not to mention birthing wards for kunoiki, who were expecting children and physical therapy rooms for shinobi who were in for long-term treatments. Sakura too was very impressed with the hospital, especially when the group entered the research room for experimental treatments, where they saw several different medical devices that they were unfamiliar with, but was clearly brand new. Not long after they entered the room, the head of New Kumo's hospitals and of its medical nin unit Anahanaritsu, also known as the Chiyu no Megami, goddess of healing, entered the room with a young woman holding a clipboard and pen. Good afternoon Sunid Sama, greeted Ritsu with her traditional kind smile. Ritsu, it's good to see you, greeted the female Hokage, as she went over and shook hands with her former student. As the last time they saw each other was after the Battle of Kanoa, but given the number of wounded there was and the state the village was in. Neither really had time to get reacquainted with one another. As it is to see you, had I known that you and your companies were touring my hospital, I would have gladly shown you around myself. There's no need for that, but we must really catch up on old times and have a drink together, stated Sunid. I would very much enjoy that Sunid Sama, replied Anahana, after which Sunid called Hanata, Ino, Tenten and Sakura. Ritsu, allow me to introduce you to Hanata, Ino and Tenten, who all studied under me for a time. Sakura is also a former student and is one of our best medics, said Sunid. I'm pleased to meet my sibling disciples, replied Anahana with another kind smile. Please allow me to introduce all of you to my assistant and one of my students, Amaru. Amaru was attractive medium tall young woman with long reddish brown hair that fell down her back. Amaru has rather thick eyebrows and blue eyes, and a mole under the left eye. She wore a cyan blue GI with a long white lab coat over it and blue pants. A pleasure to meet you all, replied Amaru with a small smile and a slight bow. I believe you've also met her husband Anasu-sama, stated Anahana, which surprised most of the groups. Wait you're married to Anasu as well. Asked Sakura, where Amaru blushed slightly, but nodded in conformation. I guess it makes sense, since Anasu did say he had six wives and two fiancés, thought Sunid, as she remembered their conversation with Anasu, where he introduced his two fiancés Sasam and Hakato and his five other wives to them. So you're another one of Grandma Sunid's student? Asked Konohamaru as he walked up to Anahana and Sunid and didn't notice the large thick marks that appeared on Sunid's head, when he called her Grandma. 
Yes, I am Konohamaru Sama, replied Unahana, as she knew who Konohamaru was from the time when he tried to see Naruto when he was in the hospital, after his battle with Orokimaru and his allies, as well as the revived Hokages. I met Sunad Sama after she left Kanoa and asked her to take me as her student for a time. Wow, so how old are you? You must be at least F, but before he could finish speaking, Konohamaru suddenly felt a strong sense of danger coming from Unahana. When he looked up, Unahana had a smile that was all too sweet, along with a dark menacing aura around her that scared the young Sarutobi clan head shitless. Konohamaru wasn't the only one that was intimated by the dark aura around her, as many of the other, including the new Kumo escort, were intimated by her. It is rather impolite to ask a lady her age Konohamaru-sama, said Unahana with a friendly tone with an underlined threat in it. At this Konohamaru gulp audibly and quickly apologized to Unahana and slowly backed away from her. Damn and I thought Ba-chan was scary when she was mad, thought the young man. After which Omoi decided to give Konohamaru some advice. Hey listen, if you know what's good for you, don't piss of Unahana-sama, as she is the most feared Konoiki in all of New Kumo, hell even the Rakage is scared of her. This of course just made Konohamaru even more fearful of Unahana, where he began to wonder how the woman could seem so kind and friendly, yet so terrifying at the same time. As the two medic nins continued to take, Unahana heard some giggling coming from the Kanoa group. When she looked over to them, she saw Jiraiya giggling to himself as he wrote down some things of his notepad. It of course did not take a genius to figure out that Jiraiya was writing up some perverted scene involving the two female medics. As soon as Unahana saw this, the next thing Jiraiya knew what was happening. A dozen or so Senban needles flew through the air at high speed and embedded themselves into the wall directly behind the toad sage. Missing Jiraiya's head by a hair's breadth and causing him to sweat profanely at how close his head had come to become pincushion. Oh please forgive Jiraiya-sama, my hand accidentally slipped. But I do hope you haven't written anything inappropriate or else you might not be so fortunate, next time, said Unahana with the same sweet smile, while holding another set of Senban needles in her hand and emanating the same dark menacing aura that she gave off a few moments ago. At the same time, Jiraiya could have sworn he saw a demonic visage appear behind Unahana, making her seem all the more terrifying. Nnn Nuo of course not, said Jiraiya fearfully as he quickly tore up his notes. I'm very pleased to hear that replied Unahana before she turned back to Sunid, who was highly amused by what her former student did. Hey, looks like Ritsu has gotten a lot better at intimidating people, thought Sunid, as she remembered a time when she was training Unahana and how she couldn't even intimidate a rabbit, let alone someone like Jiraiya. Once Ritsu turned back to Sunid, Jiraiya let out a sigh of relief, damn, there's no doubting it, she's Sunid's student, that's for sure. Eventually Ayane and the others decided to continue the tour, after which Sunid bid her former student goodbye and promised to see her later on and to talk again. For the next few hours the three groups were shown the different parts of the Shinobi districts, including the section for the different clan compounds. During the tour Danzo asked if it would be possible to visit the library of Benzaiten, but was quickly shot down by Tomo. Stating that for security reasons only shinobi, citizens and members of the Heavenly Alliance or allies of it were allowed in the library and until they became part of it, they would not be allowed entry. After a little while, the tour group was led to the Shinobi Academy, where all the ninja hopefuls were trained. The academy itself was a large white three-story building, with a wide open courtyard and several large open training fields, behind the building, which were capable of holding six separate sparing matches at once. 13. When the tour group entered the academy, like the hospital, they found the school to be quite large and spacious, with large classrooms for the different classes, subjects and class groups. They also found that the academy and had an indoor gym area for students to train in and a target room, where students could practice their throwing skills, not only outside but inside as well. Along with many other things to help the students become stronger. After seeing everything, Aruka was quite impressed with the school and could only wish that Kanoa Academy had some of the things that this academy had. Even his daughter Aiko, who was only starting in the academy, now, stated she wanted to go here to be a ninja. Eventually though, Ayane and the others told them if they were interested they would finish off the tour by going to the exam arena, which was being used right now by the students who were about to become genin and were having the graduation matches and were the first class to official graduate in New Kumo. Naturally the three groups quickly agreed and headed of in the direction. 
As they made their way to the arena, the Rokudai Mizukijime decided to voice a question she had been wondering for a while. Excuse Ayane san, but if you don't mind, could you perhaps answer a personal question? It would depend on the question, Mizukij sama Ayane replied simply. Well, if you don't mind, could you perhaps tell me why is it that Kunoiki, like yourself, Yuffie san, Tomo san, as well as the Lightning Daimyo, are married to the Reikij? I can understand that he needs to marry multiple wives so to repopulate his clan quickly. But I'm still curious what attracted you to him, especially the Lightning Daimyo. At this question everyone began to listen, since it was a question many had worried themselves. To put it simply Mizukij Sama, virtually all the Reikage's marriages to us and the others, were arranged. Arranged. Repeated May. Yes, you see after the civil war as you can guess, there was still much turmoil among the different factions on the rebel side, and those that fought for the Godime Reikage and the former Lightning Daimyo. Naturally given how Kicho-sama was a woman and was so young and unmarried, most of the noble men and lords did not believe she was up to the task. She also had limited military support, with only the Naomasa samurai clan, the Yun Shinobi clan and her cousin Date Masamune and his clan, supporting her. Naruto also faced a similar problem, when Kicho-sama appointed him the Rokudaim Reikage, as despite having both the respect and loyalty of most of the Shinobi and the Shinobi clans. Naruto's position politically was vulnerable. Since there were still some who did not approve of having a Reikage who was not from our village or country, despite the fact that he defeated the Godime Reikage and led us to victory in the war. Fearing another possible civil war, Juge Liang Sama proposed a solution, which was for Naruto kun and Kicho Sama to marry one another. And how exactly did that help? asked Hinata, who was curious as to how Naruto got married. By marrying the Reikage, Kicho Sama secured her position as Daimyo since not only could she later produce an heir to the throne by marrying the Reikage. She also gained the military support of the Reikage and New Kumo, which she needed to ensure that none of the other lords or noblemen decided to try and attempt a coup. Since everyone knew how powerful the Reikage was by the end of the civil war, and had no wish to challenge him. At the same time, marrying Kicho Sama secured the Reikage's position politically, as not only would he have her political support but it would also solidify his loyalty to the country, thereby calm some of the people who had a problem with Naruto-kun. At hearing this, Mei and the others nodded, as it did make sense. But what about you and the others? asked Hanata. After the new Kumo Council was formed, naturally most of the members on the new council wanted Naruto and Anasu to rebuild their clan in new Kumo. So they voted to place the Clan Restoration Act on them. After which some of the clans like Suavans, Yugitos and mine arranged to have us marry Naruto, which was to secure Naruto's loyalty to the village. While other clans like Tomos and Yuffies, did it so that people could be certain that their clans were loyal to the village, explained Ayane before she continued on. As for Taira, Takara and Nanao, they were selected since they were among some of the village's best kaneki and weren't from any clans thereby assuring that any children they would have with the Reikage, would have no ties to other clans, so to assure some independence for the Reikage's clan later on. They were also chosen because, they all had some prior relationships with Naruto, where they fought alongside him in the war, like some of the rest of us. But what about the rest? asked Tenten. Well back when the Heavenly Alliance was first being formed, the Reikage went to Haru, Yuki no Kuni, Spring, Snow Country, for support and aid to rebuild the country and build new Kumo. There he revealed himself to Kayuki Sama, where she agreed to help us but in return the Reikage had to agree to marry her. Since like Kicho Sama, Kayuki Sama was having some problems with holding her position as Daimyo. As some of the former supporters of the previous Daimyo, her uncle Doto tried to arrange several marriages for her with men of their choosing. Stating that she needed to marry and produce an heir to the throne, where they could then use the man she married to wrestle control of the country from her. But by marrying the Reikage she removed that problem and secured her position, since the lords could not object to the Reikage. Since he was a hero to the nation for helping to remove the pervious Daimyo and helping to find the generator to bring spring and summer to the country. As for Fu, continued Ayane, she was arranged to marry the Reikage by her cousin Shibuki, after Takagaku joined the Heavenly Alliance. As a sign of commitment to the Heavenly Alliance by his village, while also assuring she would be safe. Since he feared for her safety from the Akitsuki, given how one of the members at the time was a former shinobi of his village and knew its secret location. 
But what about the high priestess of Oni no Kuni, demon country, the daimyo of Ene no Kuni, vegetable country, and Hanzo's granddaughter Okatsu? 14 asked Temari. Okatsu, met Naruto and Anasu a year before they joined the civil war here and traveled with him, where she eventually developed feelings for Naruto. Shien and Haruna also met Naruto earlier on, where he helped save both them and their countries on separate occasions, where like Okatsu they develop feelings for him. But as for Shizuka, well the rakage has you to thank Jiraiya-san, answered Ayane, while saying Jiraiya's name coldly, since she didn't hold the man in high regard. Me, cried Jiraiya is in surprise, as like everyone else this was the first he was hearing about it. Hold on a second, you mean the leader of Nadashiko, she's married to Naruto, asked Kiba in disbelief. No, she engaged to him, she is arranged to marry him later on after her village becomes part of the Heavenly Alliance, replied Tomo simply. Natural everyone in the group was shocked at this news, where Kiba once again cursed Naruto's luck and swore that his friend and former rival must have the devil's luck on his side. But wait, how the hell did I help him with her? Asked Jiraiya, who was still confused. So you're telling us that you don't remember battling the former leader of Nadashiko to a standstill? After which you promised her that your student and her daughter would later finish the battle you both started, where if he beats her, she would marry him, said Yuffie. After hearing this, Jiraiya blushed red in embarrassment, as he had indeed forgotten that promise. When everyone turned to look at him, all the toad sage could do was scratch his head embarrassingly and say, oops. At this Sunid slapped her head in disbelief and mutter, Barker, while everyone else just rolled their eyes or shook their heads in disbelief. Soon after though, Hanata decided to ask Ayane and the others a question she had been wondering ever since she heard that they were married to Naruto. Do you love him? Excuse me Hanata-san, asked Ayane. Do you love Naruto-kun? Asked Hanata. At this question, the three girls remained silent for several minutes, but surprisingly enough Tomo answered Hanata's question. I won't deny that when Ayane, Yuffi, I and some of the others first married Naruto-kun, we weren't exactly thrilled with the situation. But regardless to what happened, Naruto-kun went out of his way to make the best of it, he never forced us to do anything we didn't want. He went out of his way to get to know us and treat us respect and kindness and did the utmost to make us happy. He has been nothing more than a good husband to all of us and a loving father to Yemi, Nene and Yoshiko, answered Tomo, before a small smile appeared. And over time you could say the fool grew on us and we grew to care for him, since I don't think we could have gotten a more decent man or person to be with given the circumstances. So to answer your question Hinata-san, yes we do. At hearing this, both Ayane and Yuffie smile and nodded in agreement with Tomo, as they were of the same mind. Hinata although maintained a blank look on her face, so not to give her feelings on Tomo's answer away, where she simply thanked Tomo for answering and remained in silent thought. For the remainder of the journey the tour group remained silent until they arrived at the arena. Naturally when the shinobi representative saw the size of stadium they were surprised. The stadium was circular in shape with a radius of 50 yards and could easily hold a few thousand people and had a massive television screen for people to the fight from as well. The fighting square was in the center of the stadium and there were two long stairs and paths that lead to the fighting square on opposite ends of the stadium, which allowed rival teams or opponents to walk down and meet one another at the square. The arena itself was about 12 meters below the stands and surrounded by a large wall so that no stray attacks hit the spectators. 15. When the tour group arrived they found the graduation students preparing to start their matches. Surprisingly enough Naruto's adopted daughter Yami, Nene and Yoshiko were among the graduating students. Deciding to enjoy the matches and see what the next generation of new Kumo Shinobi were capable of. The tour group made their way to the stands and sat in the seats directly in front of the class, who were standing in the middle of the arena. Down with the graduation students. Okay class, now as you know these matches are to evaluate your overall skill level, so you're allowed to use Jutsu. Now this will not affect your overall grade, but it will help to finalize your genin team for next week. Also you should all know that if any of the other instructors or I feel that a match has gone too far we will stop the fight, is that clear? Said the instructor. Hi sensei, replied the students. Also as you can see in the stands, we have some visiting dignitaries here today watching us. So I expect all of you to do your best and to hold yourself up to the high standard of our village, am I clear? Stated the instructor, where the students once again responded with a, hi. 
Very good, now we'll start things off. First up Kono Rai versus Mori Kira, stated the instructor, where the two students walked forward, while the rest of the class fell back to watch the match. With the observers. So they're starting things off with that kid from Kono clan, commented Ayane. The Kono clan, I've never heard of them, stated Sakura. Can't say I'm surprised, they aren't really a well-known clan and are quite small and there aren't that many of them left in the village. Since most of the clan was killed in the civil war, where they fought on the Godime Rakage's side, answered Karui. So what makes this kid so special? Asked Kiba. Well according to his reports, he's the most gifted student in the class and is an acclaimed prodigy and has already been named the Rookie of the Year. His own clan even calls him the hope of the Kono clan, since they're depending on him to help restore their clan esteem. That's quite a lot of pressure to put on someone his age, Kakashi commented. Perhaps, but as Karui said, the clan has fallen on hard times, answered Simui. Rai had long black hair that is bound in a white wrap, he had golden eyes and had a red bandana around his head and wore white martial arts style clothing. Thinking that the fight would be interesting to watch, the shinobi representatives watched the match carefully. Sadly though, the match didn't last very long, where Rai proved to be too much for his opponent, where the young man took down his opponent in under 10 seconds, with a series of fast and powerful taijutsu moves. Damn that didn't take long, the kid is fast I'll give him that commented Jiraiya, as Rai was already as fast as a low-level chunin. Soon enough though, after Rai and his opponent had left the arena the instructor called out the next set of names, where one of them was a young girl named Rin, who was also from the Kono clan and another girl. Rin had golden eyes like Rai and had red hair that framed her face and had it tied in a loose ponytail that fell down to the middle of her back. She wore a white Chinese top with pink strips and wore baggy white shinobi pants. Another Kono member, Neji commented. Yay! but she's from a separate branch of the clan, answered Yuffie. And trust me, if what I've heard about her true, she's no pushover and is a real firecracker. Not to mention she was one of the contenders for top kunoiki. Like with Rai's fight, the shinobi representatives watched the fight between the two young would-be kunoiki and like Rai's it fight didn't last very long. In fact, it was even quicker than Rai's, wherein opponent, tried to hit her with a series of fast jabs. But each time the girl avoided the punches without much trouble and before the boy knew it. He found his legs being kicked from underneath him and landing flat on his back, after which Rin stood over him ready to deliver the finished blow. Damn and I thought the last kid was fast, said Jiraiya, since Rin was even faster than her clansman Rai was. After Rin and her opponent left the arena, the instructor called out another pair of names, one of whom was named Lan who was also another member of the Kono clan like Rin and Rai. In fact according to Yuffie, he was the elder twin brother of Rin. Lan had spiky jet black hair that was done up in a small ponytail and like his twin sister and Rai had golden eyes, which according to Ayane was a trait shared among the clan. He wore dark blue shinobi pants and bandages around his forearms and hands and wore a long yellow trench coat with green edges to cover his bare torso. He also wore a necklace around his neck with small green stones on it, which were shaped like claws down in the arena. Once both Lan and his opponent were facing one another the instructor raised up his arm and cried, begin. As soon as they heard the instructor shouting, begin, Lan opponent charged forward and attempted a forward punch. Lan quickly responded to this by sidestepping the punch and grabbing hold of his opponent, where he then flipped the young boy over. Acting quickly, Lan opponent did a mid-air flip and landed on his feet and then quickly spun around and threw several shuriken at Lan who skillfully did a backflip to avoid the shuriken and then turned around and did several hand seals. After which he cried, Rayton, Ratio, lightning style, lightning palm. A and charged forward with his hand covered in a thin layer of lightning. Seeing Lan charging towards him, Lan opponent immediately jumped backwards in an attempt to avoid the attack. But unfortunately, Lan was too fast and his opponent couldn't avoid his attack completely, where Lan was able to touch his opponent's chest. After Lan placed his hand on his opponent's chest, a small charge of lightning traveled through his body and caused it to go stiff. Once Lan's opponent hit the ground and the instructor refereeing the match saw that the other boy could no longer move, he declared Lan the winner. With the observers. Impressive, he is already able to use his nature affinity and is able to do Raten Jutsu, commented Shino. Yes, in the beginning of their last year, all academy students are tested on their nature affinity. 
so that they can be taught how to do D rank level elemental jutsu that suits their elemental affinity and should they show enough skill and talent, we even teach some C rank jutsu, stated Samui. Isn't that a little advance for them? asked Aruka. We don't see it that way, answered Samui, since by doing this we can better prepare them for the shinobi world and have them fitted with the right team and sensei, so that they can reach their full potential. Also it gives those who do not come from a shinobi background a more equal chance, since those who come from shinobi clans and families will naturally have more advanced training thanks to the help of their family or clansmen. We also teach students, tree walking, water walking and sort students in different teams each week, when they do E-rank missions in the village. So to find out who works best with whom in terms of skill and cooperation. We even give them some voluntary classes to take or test them on certain types of techniques, like fuenjutsu, genjutsu or other things, to see if they have any interest or talent in any of them. After hearing this, Aruka had to admit that what Samui was saying did make sense, and it was definitely a broad way of doing things. Since it gave students the chance to maximize their potential and gave them a more advanced start than most genin from other villages. After Lan and his opponent left the arena, the instructor called out the next pair of names, the first was a young boy named Sora Tetsu and the other was a young girl named Shinman Fukuti. Tetsu was a tall young boy who looked to be coming into his early teens, he had spiky brown hair and brown eyes and wore loose fitting blue pants, an orange shirt and a grey jacket with a furry hood over it. Futeki was a young girl, who looked to be about a year younger than Tetsu and was at least a head shorter than him. She had dark hair that she had tied up in a bun and wore a yellow shirt and green pants. But the thing that caught most people's attention was her pale white blank eyes indicating the girl was blind. Oh, this should be interesting, said Yuffie as she grinned with excitement. What do you mean? You can't expect that girl to fight that other kid. She obviously blind, she doesn't stand a chance, stated Kankuro. You forget Kankuro-san, in the shinobi world appearances can be deceptive and I can assure you, young Futeki is highly capable, despite her lack of sight, replied Tomo. Agreed, she is also quite skilled as she is the younger sister of Shinmanuki, the Chi no Megami, goddess of earth, and member of the Go Genso no Megami, five elemental goddesses, added Ayane. So who's the kid that she's going against then? asked Temari. He's a former refugee, who the rakage allowed into the village along with some others after their village was destroyed by a group of rogue shinobi, answered Omoi. Is he any good? asked Tenten. If we were to judge him by his school report and record, then I would say no he isn't. He's basically the class clown, as he prefers making jokes and skips most of classes and avoids sparing with the rest of his class or loses the matches. In fact according to his teachers he basically gives up as soon as the fight starts, but seemingly the rakage states that he's more than he appears and says he has great potential, Simwi stated. At hearing this, many of the shinobi representatives grew curious and wondered what Naruto saw in the young man. Down in the arena. Well, well, looks like you drew the short straw here Tetsu, mocked Futeki as she faced against Tetsu. At this comment, Tetsu just sighed as he kept his hand in his pocket, indicating that he didn't want to fight. Sigh, I don't really want to fight you Futeki, can't we just say you won and leave it at that, since this fight won't really affect us. Afraid not, replied Futeki, before she took a set of kunai and threw them at Tetsu, who barely avoided them, by jumping to his right. But as soon as he did, Futeki appeared in front of him and attempted to punch him in the face, which he barely avoided by sidestepping the punch. After which the young man disappeared and reappeared behind Futeki. Light on your feet as always Tetsu, but then again you always were good at running away, said Futeki as she turned around to face her opponent. Listen Futeki, I don't really want to fight you, said Tetsu, hoping to end the fight. Well too bad for you, replied the blind girl as she did some hand seals and cried, Doton, Doryuso, earth style, earth flow spears. After which a spike made out of earth erupted out of the ground in front Tetsu, nearly impaling him. Fortunately though Tetsu acted quickly and jumped up into the air and avoided the earth spike. After which he landed gracefully on top of the spike and threw a set of shuriken at Futeki. Who responded by blocking the shuriken with Doton. Dorokugeshi Earth Release, Earth Shore Return. With the observers. Most impressive, Shino commented, since like most of the other shinobi, he was impressed how a girl like Futeki could use two C rank jutsu in a row. Yay, but how in the hell can she see that guy? I thought she was blind, said Konohamaru. 
She is blind, but she is using her chakra to enhance her hearing and sensing for his chakra, techniques which are techniques used in the blind assassin style if I'm not mistake, answered Kakashi. As he remembered from Sakura's report on her rescue from, the hold, that the storm shinobi of New Kumo were trained in the blind assassin style. Correct, answered Tomo, the rakage gave Futeki permission to learn the blind assassin style. He then allowed her to join the academy once she had mastered some of the sensing techniques to a satisfactory degree. By using these skills she can follow her opponent's movements by sound or chakra alone, or even detect an incoming attack by sound alone. When the Kanoa, Suna and Kiri groups heard this, many of them could not but be further impressed with the young girl, as to learn techniques like that at her age, was no small feat. It also proved what Tomo said earlier, that Futeki was more than she appeared. Down at the arena, after blocking Tetsu's last attack, Futeki deactivated her last jutsu, where the wall of earth fell back into the ground. HMPH, about time you grew a pair and started fighting back, replied Futeki with a smirk. Like I said I don't want to fight you Futeki, so let just end this, stated Tetsu calmly. Fine I will, responded the girl, where she too took out some kuni and threw them at Tetsu, who remained perfectly still on the top of the earth spike as they flew right past him. This of course surprised and confused many of those watching the fight, as Futeki aim had been dead on and yet she still missed, it was as if something had diverted them from hitting Tetsu. 17. Annoyed by how she somehow missed, Futeki took out several more shuriken and kunai and threw them at Tetsu. Seeing the projectiles coming at him, Tetsu remained perfectly calm and right before they could hit him. Tetsu raised his hand up and waved his hand away and said, Takuetsufu prevailing wind. B after which a powerful blast of wind erupted and blew the projectiles and Fuketi away, where their young girl was sent flying several out of the fighting square. With the observers. Naturally after seeing this everyone was completely stunned, even Ayane and all the other new Kumo shinobi were shocked by Tetsu's sudden show of power. Impossible, how could a mere genin create a wind attack that strong without any hand seals or even a fan? Said Baki in disbelief. It was at this point that the large group suddenly heard amused laughter coming from behind them. When the tall group turned around and looked up, they saw none other than Naruto sitting on one of the seats and was accompanied by Shin Manuki, his bodyguard's wives Yugito, Fu and Oksu, as well as secretary wife Nanao and his other wives Taira, Swafon and Takara. When everyone saw them, they all thought the exact same thing, when did the hell did they arrive? And how did they appear without us sensing them? Naruto what are you doing here and when did you arrive? Asked Sunid when she saw the young male blonde. I though you said you had your talks with Iwa today. I was here before any of you arrived, we were just at the other end of the arena, and decided to join you after a little while. As for the talks with Iwa, I finished them early, since you hardly expect me to miss my own daughter's graduation exam, replied Naruto with a smile, which caused everyone else to either shake their heads in disbelief or smile in amusement at Naruto actions. At the same time, the others saw that Tetsu had been declared the winner, as Fuketi was still trying to regain herself after being blown away by Tetsu's sudden win attack. Did you know about his abilities? Asked Tomo as she turned to her husband. Yes, I've known about his abilities from some time. Despite Tetsu having no real desire to fight or be a shinobi and being more of a joker. He is a phenomenal talent for futon, wind-style, jutsu and as you saw. He has an almost unnatural control over the wind itself, which you all saw when he defeated Uki's younger sister Fatari. Naturally the four groups of shinobi were shocked by this news. If he had no desire to be a shinobi, why did he even join the academy? Also if he had such natural skill, then why didn't he reveal it to his teachers or during his futon classes? Asked Ayane. Simply put, the boy became a shinobi because he needs money. You see his sister was born with a very weak body and she gets sick very easily. There is a treatment, but sadly the operation is very expensive and since both their parents are dead, she depends on him. That's why he joined the academy, since he saw being a shinobi the only way he could possibly earn enough money to pay for his sister operation. The whole class clown thing is a facade he has going, so that people won't think much of him, especially when he skips class to care for his sister, explained Naruto sadly. But why does he hide it? Asked Hanata. He doesn't want to gain attention, where people would find out about him and his sister, and would pity them. This is something he does not want, as he is a rather proud boy, Naruto answered, 
since in many ways Tetsu reminded him of himself when he was the young boy's age. But how is he able to have such control over the wind? Asked Temari, as she never seen anyone have such natural control over their affinity at such a young age. I've a theory towards that, but I'm afraid I can't share it right now, since I'm not a hundred percent certain of it yet, stated Naruto, where before anyone could even try to ask further. Naruto said the next match was about to start, which was between two young Kaneki, one of whom Naruto was very interested in. The girl in question was named Naoru Suki, like Tetsu, she was a refugee from the same village that Naruto allowed into the new Kumo after their village was destroyed by rogue Shinobi. According to her instructor's reports, she had excellent control over her chakra and had a possible talent for medical ninjutsu. She also showed signs of having a high aptitude when it came to suit and water style, not unlike Tetsu, when it came to futon. Suki was a medium-tall attractive young girl, with long dark hair that was done up in a long ponytail that reached down below her back. She wore a bright blue dress that had wave designs and short selves and was spilt on the sides. That would give her plenty of freedom to move around and wore cream shorts underneath, along with long black stockings and simple saddles. As the shinobi representatives watched the fight, many were impressed with Suki's suit and skills, which seemed so natural, where she used water from a water satchel that she carried on her lower back, to fight her female opponent. During the fight Suki, used a Mizubushi no Jutsu water clone technique, to attack and distract her opponent. While she used her remaining water to use Sutan, Sweeban water style, water whip to bind and hold the other girl. After the fight was declare over and Suki the winner, Naruto and the others continued to watch the next couple battles for the next several minutes, where eventually the instructor called out their names Amako Reizo and Ashida Soken. Reizo was about average height for a 13-year-old, with white hair and crimson red eyes he wore simple red button shirt with black pants and a long black coat. Soken was roughly the same height as Reizo, with a narrow frame, he had short dark hair and grey eyes and wore grey shorts and a white shirt and carried bow on his back. When the three cages and their parties heard the name Amako, they all had a surprised looks. Amako, as in the Amako clan, asked Homura, where he got a nodded of acknowledgement from Naruto. But I thought the Amako clan was wiped out after the civil war, stated the shinobi elder. That's actually incorrect, after the godime rakage Amako Zankuro was killed, what was left of his clan fled the country, fearing that we would have killed them all in revenge for what they did, answered Naruto. But if they all fled, why is he still here? Asked Ino. The reason is because we found him shortly after the godime rakage was killed, before his clan fled the country. Once the war ended, I decided to let him stay and allowed him to become a shinobi when he applied to join the academy, explained Naruto. Before anyone else in the group could ask anything more about Reizo or his clan, Naruto indicated that the match was about to start and that he wished to watch it. Down in the arena, as soon as the two genin stood opposite one another Soken glared angrily at Reizo, as he took off his bow and prepared to fight. You're going to pay for what you and your clan did to my family and everyone else in my clan, stated Soken angrily as he gathered his chakra and had it form into an arrow where he strung it onto his bow. I may be of the Amako clan Soken, but I have had nothing to do with what the god I'm rakage and what the rest of my clan did, replied Reizo calmly, but with a tone of remorse as he remembered what his clan had done. TSK, save your excuse, you're just like, him, his blood runs through your veins after all. Maybe, but it is not by choice and although I may have, his blood running through my veins, I am not him, and he, is dead. Then maybe you should join him. Yell Soken, after which the referee shouted begin and Soken fired his chakra no ya, chakra arrow, C, at Reizo. Who disappeared and reappeared behind Soken and kicked him hard in the back, while his chakra arrow flew to the other end of the large arena and exploded when it hit the wall. Recovering quickly, Soken turned around and fired another arrow at Reizo, who evaded it like the other one, and then appeared in front of Soken and gave him a strong punch in the stomach, causing him to keel over in pain. Give up, you can't win if you can't hit me, stated Reizo as she stood over Soken. Never, yelled Soken as he got up and swung his bow at Reizo, which jumped back to avoid it. After which Soken fired three arrows made out of chakra in rapid succession, but like before Reizo skillfully avoid them with his high speed. With the observers. As Naruto and the others watched the battle progress, many were impressed with Reizo's speed, which on pair with Lee without his weights back when he was competing in the Chunin exam. 
look at him go, commented Tenton as she watched the young boy evaded all his opponent's attacks. Yosh. Truly he is in the springtime of his youth, declared Lee. But how is he able to be so fast? Asked Neji. I highly doubt that New Kumo's academy would follow the same kind of physical training that Guy Sensei did when training Lee. I believe it's more to do with his blood limit, than physical training, am I correct? Stated Kakashi, as she turned to Naruto and the others. You are Hatakai-san, replied Takara. What exactly is the Amako blood limit? Asked Udon. Reizo and his clan blood limit is called the Karenga Sandaparusu, crying thunder pulse. It allows the user to amplify his or her bioelectric current, thereby allowing the user to create lightning jutsus without having to use chakra or use hand seals to a limited degree. They can even combine their bioelectric current with their lightning chakra to increase the attack power of any lightning technique that they use. But the blood limit's greatest ability is that it allows its users to naturally enhance their bodies, speed, strength and power, by using their bioelectric current to electrically stimulating their nervous system and speed up their neural synapses. This is what Reizo is using to enhance his speed to such an extent, it's even said that the Reiten no Yoroi, lightning style armor, was based on this blood limit, explained Nanao as if she was quoting a book. 16. Well it certainly explains things, answered Neji, since he had found it hard to believe and a young boy, who wasn't even a genin yet, could be as fast as Lee was when they were younger. Since Lee had spent a whole year in specialized training under Guy to be that fast. Although like most things that increase a person's natural abilities quickly, the technique Reizo was using was taking its toll on his body, as by using his Byakugan. Neji could see the stress the technique was putting Reizo's body the longer he used it, since he was clearly not used to moving so fast, yet impressively Reizo hid this, as he maintained a expressionless facade. But as worn out as Reizo was becoming, Soken was even more exhausted, as by using his chakra no ya multiple times, he was running low on chakra very quickly, where he could barely stand. Down at the arena, I suggest that you forfeit now Soken you've used up nearly all of your chakra, you cannot continue, I do not wish to hurt you, stated Reizo. Since for the majority of the fight he had been doing nothing more than dodging Soken's attacks, hoping to wear the Ashida member down. As he didn't want to hurt him, given what his clan had done to Soken's family and clan members. I'll never give up to you. Spat Soken before he fired another chakra arrow at Reizo, who avoided it like all the others. But unlike this time, Soken raised his hand up and had the arrow change its direction to follow Reizo. Sadly though, Soken overestimated his control, where instead of moving to where Reizo was, the arrow moved too far and headed straight to where the students who had yet to fight were waiting. The arrow hit the top section of the arena wall that they were standing next to and caused a small explosion. When the chakra arrow hit the wall, most of the students were able to jump away. The only exception was a young girl who tripped when she tried to jump away from the explosion. Those watching could only watch in horror as a large piece of the wall broke off and crashed on top of the helpless girl. But just as the dust settled from the fallen chuck of the wall, the students, instructors and other observers saw a human-shaped silhouette appear in the dust cloud, where after a few seconds, Reizo walked out of the dust cloud holding the young girl in his arms. Upon seeing Reizo, everyone quickly realized that in the space of only two seconds, Reizo had crossed the distance from where he was fighting to the young girl and carried her away from the falling piece of wall. After coming out of the dust cloud, Reizo placed the girl down, who was fairly shook up from what happened. Quickly enough, one of the instructors went up to the girl and took her away to be checked up. But before she left she thanked Reizo for saving her, although strangely enough, she looked hesitant at first, as if she was unsure whether she should thank him or not. Once everything settled down a bit, the referee of the match stated that the match was to be declared unfinished given what had happened and because Soken was unable to fight. After which Soken was taken away to be taken care of for chakra exhaustion, where he would most likely receive some kind of punishment for endangering his classmates. With the observers. Well that was certainly more exciting than I expected, commented Tyra. Agreed, the boy went too far, although considering that he went up against Reizo of all people, I can't say I blame for lashing out, stated Swarfon. What do you mean, I get that he hates that Reizo brat because he is an Amako. But that still doesn't explain why he hates him to that extent or why that girl was so hesitant to even thank. Even after he saved her life, you think she'd be a little more grateful, Jiraiya remarked. 
Sokan's reasons for hating Reizo so much is similar to the reason why the Yondaim Suchikij Ryoku and Iwa hates me, answered Naruto neutrally. What do you mean? asked Choji, not fully understand what Naruto was saying. To put it simply, Reizo is the son of the former god I'm Reikij Amako Zankuro. He's his son, repeated Koharu in shock, where Naruto just nodded again. You knew this and yet you let him live and allowed him to become a shinobi for your village, said Danzo. Who couldn't believe that Naruto was actually that naive and that he would let the son of his former enemy live and allow him to be trained as a shinobi in his own village? Since to Danzo to do something like that was not only foolish, but was basically giving Reizo an open invitation to try and kill Naruto. Unlike you Danzo I refuse to kill innocent children, simply because of who their parents are, Naruto replied with a sneer. Reizo, maybe Zankuro's son, but he isn't Zankuro himself and children should not be punished for their parents' sin. And what will you do, when he comes seeking revenge on you for killing his father? Asked Danzo, since he found Naruto reasoning for letting Reizo live not only foolhardy, but naive. Although on the other hand, the fact of who Reizo was, presented an opportunity that could be useful to him, Danzo, at a later time. Should that day ever come, I will deal with it accordingly, but until then I will put my faith in Reizo and allow him to make his own choices. By believing he can become better than his father and possibly redeem his clan in the future, stated Naruto. At this, Danzo only scoffed, since at that moment Naruto sounded just like the Sandime, giving one of his speeches of peaceful coexisting, naive fool. Soon after, the excitement of the pervious match died down and the instructors decided continued and finished the remaining matches off, where for the next hour, Naruto and the others watched the remaining genin candidates fight one another. Eventually they came to the last three matches, which was what Natuo and the others wanted to see the most, since they involved Naruto's three daughters Nene, Yoshiko and Yami. Nene match was the first of the remaining three to start, where she faced against a young girl, who looked to be about 12. Surprisingly though the match didn't last very long, where as soon as the referee cried begin, Nene disappeared and reappeared in front of the opponent, where she delivered a strong punch to the stomach. Nene then followed up with a series of strong kicks and a few more punches. In less than a minute the battle was over, where the young girl was lying on the ground with several injuries. HMPH that went quicker than I thought, commented Anko in surprise, as she had to admit Nene was pretty fast for her age. Not as fast as Tetsu and Reizo, but fast nonetheless. Nene-chan is really strong, isn't she too San? Said Aiko, as she turned to her father Aruka. That she is, I'm guessing you've been training her and her sisters, Aruka commented where he turned to Naruto. I may have taught them a thing or two, replied Naruto with a small smirk. Yeah I beat, but then again she and her sisters will need it to beat back all the guys that will probably come after them. Once they get a little older, Kiba said with a smile, as he remembered the image of what Nene and her sister were to look like when they got older. Although that smirk quickly disappeared with he saw Naruto frown and began to generate lightning around his body. If those little punks think that they can go near my little girls, they're going to be in for a rude shock. Stated Naruto, as he held up his hand and generated even more lightning and had a sadistic smile on his face, one that impressed even Anko, as he thought about all about the different, fun, things he would do to any boys that tried to date his little girls. Damn who would have ever guessed that the brat was the overprotective father type, soon had thought. Who are, why do all men have to like this, when it comes to their daughters, though Yugito with a sigh. A word of advice dog boy, said Karui in a low voice. Unless you want to become a human lightning rod, you won't say the word boyfriend around the Rokodime, as it's kind of a taboo word with him. Besides between you and me, I don't think there be many boys willing to go after those three when they get older. Why the hell not? Those three will be knockouts once they hit puberty, Kiba whispered back. Well think about it, the Rokodime is the strongest shinobi in Cage Alive. He also rules over the strongest shinobi nation and commands thousands of loyal assassins. Not to mention he wields one of the strongest bloodlines in exist and contains the strongest of the nine-tailed beasts. Most guys would be too scared to ask him out in case they piss him off. At this kind of reasoning Kiba had to agree in that Karui did have a point, which kind of made Kiba pity any guy that did try to date Nene and her sisters. Since given the look that Naruto had right now, those poor souls would be in for a world of suffering. Soon enough though, Kiba was brought out of his musing by Sakura, who suddenly spoke up. What is she doing down there? 
with Nene in the arena. After being declared the winner by the referee and seeing that her opponent couldn't move due to the injury she received from her attacks, Nene quickly walked over to the girl and kneeled down to her. Don't move, I'll help you. Listening to what Nene was telling her, the girl did what she was told. After which Nene closed her eyes and placed her hand on the girl's forehead and channeled her chakra into the girl. When she did this, her hand glowed green and spread throughout the girl's body and healed all her injuries within seconds. Once all of the girl's injuries were healed, Nene helped the girl up, who thanked her, after which they left the arena together. With the observers. Did she use some kind of medical ninjutsu? Asked Ino. She couldn't have, she didn't do any hand seals, stated Sunit, since she found it unlikely that New Kumo's academy would teach any medical ninjutsu that advance. All she did was touch her forehead. Actually, all she did was channel her chakra into the girl's body, explained Naruto, gaining everyone's attention again. What do you mean by that? Asked Sakura. Like my mother, both Nene and Yoshiko were born with special chakra that grants them special abilities. Nene's chakra allows her to heal injuries at a much higher rate, similar to the Inu Shomatsu, Yin healing wound destruction technique that Snake Kabuto uses. She can also heal other people as you saw by simply sending her chakra into another person's body. The full extent of her chakra's healing power is still unknown, but I've seen her heal many serious injuries in minutes, that would normally take days if not weeks to heal. Amazing, thought Sunid as she thought about the possibilities of having someone like Nene as a medic nin. Given how it was obvious that if Nene could be trained to use her chakra correctly, she could very well become one of the greatest medics to have ever lived. I wouldn't get any ideas if I were you Sunid, commented Naruto, when he saw the thoughtful look on Sunid's face. Ritsu has already made plans to make Nene her apprentice, once she gets a little older. At hearing this, Sunid was naturally a little disappointed, since it wasn't every day that one would find a person with such an obvious talent to be a medic as Nene. But she soon got over it, since she knew that Unahana would train the girl well. If you do not mind me asking Reikage Sama, but since your daughter has this remarkable ability. Would I be correct in assuming that her twin has the same ability? Asked Shino. No Yoshiko's chakra has a completely different ability, answered Naruto. And what is her ability? Asked Neji. You're about to find out, Naruto responded as he indicated back at the arena, as Yoshiko and her opponent were called out and walked out to the middle of the arena. With Yoshiko in the arena. After walking to the middle of the arena, Yoshiko and her opponent faced off against one another. After the referee shouted, begin. Yoshiko's opponent made the first move where he took out a kunai and threw it as her. Naturally Yoshiko dunked under the kunai and charged at her opponent, who quickly blocked her punch with his arm. After which for the next few minutes, the two genin fought each other in taijutsu. As the fight progressed, the two would be genin proved to be evenly matched, although Yoshiko was much faster than her opponent, which she used to her advantage and delivered a strong kick to the boy's stomach before he could block it, which forced him back a few feet. Recovering quickly, the young boy did some hand seals and thought Katen, Hosenka no Jutsu, fire style, Phoenix Sage fire technique. Before spitting out a volley of fireballs at Yoshiko. Acting fast, Yoshiko narrowly avoided the small balls of fire by using her high speed to dodge them, although received a few scorch marks on her clothes. But once she avoided all them, she began to do a set of her own hand seals, and then said, Hayden, Genju no Jutsu, secret art, mystic beast technique. D and released a large amount of chakra, which formed around her. After which the chakra began to take of a large blue hawk with red eyes and three large blue wolves with the same glowing red eyes. Get him, said Yoshiko, as she pointed at her opponent, who was completely stunned by what Yoshiko did. Before he knew it, the large chakra hawk began to attack him, taking out a kunai, the young boy tried to fight the chakra bird off, but kept missing it. The next thing the boy knew, he was he was on the ground with two chakra wolves pinning his arms to the ground and the third on his stomach growling at him, telling him not to move. Seeing that the boy could no longer fight the referee declared Yoshiko the winner. Once she had been declared the winner Yoshiko went over and touched her animals and reabsorbed them into her, after which she helped her opponent back onto his feet and congratulated him on fight so well. With the observers. Incredible, so that the special power of her chakra, muttered Sunid, as like everyone else she was shocked after seeing Yoshiko's unique power. Trust me Sunid, that just a taste of what she can do, since it's a lucky thing that kid didn't destroy her animals, 
because if he had, he would have been in for a rather nasty surprise, said Naruto with an amused smirk. But how exactly is she able to do this? Asked Gara, as releasing that much concentrated chakra all at once, goes far beyond the capability any normal genin, let alone do something like that. Well as I said earlier, Yoshiko's chakra is very unique, like Nene's. You see Yoshiko was born with a very highly level of chakra like myself, but it is much more dense than most people's. This means she can do jutsu with less chakra than is normally required for specific ones. Yet despite having such large amount of chakra, she is able to control it perfectly, which I guess is because it's so dense, explained Naruto before continuing. During her training with me, she inadvertently created a small kitty made out of chakra, after which with the help of Juj Liang Sensei as well the Ashida clan Hedrukan, we helped her develop her technique fully. I must admit, that a very impressive technique, especially for a child of her age, you should be commended Reikage sama commented the Mizukage, who was greatly impressed with Yoshiko's power. Thank you, but Yoshiko is the one who should be praised for mastering her technique not me, since it is a technique she and she alone can use. After a few minutes the last match between for the graduating class began, which was between Naruto eldest daughter Yami and a tall dark-skinned young man, who towered over Yami by at least a head and a half. Yet despite his towering size over the blonde girl, the boy actually looked scared of Yami, who remained expressionless as always. Hey Naruto Ni, aren't you worried about that guy that going against Yami-chan, asked Konohamaru, when he saw that Naruto wasn't the least bit worried about his daughter's opponent. Nah, Yami is more than capable of handling herself, in fact I'm more worried about her opponent than I am of Yami, replied Naruto. Poor guy. I really feel sorry for him, of all the people he would face, it had to be Yami, commented Yuffie with a knowing smirk. I do hope, that Yami-chan shows some restraint and doesn't go too hard on the boy, commented Taya, with some concern. This of course made all the non-new Kumo nins wonder what was it that Yami could do, to make Naruto and everyone else so confident of her victory. With Yami, after the referee shouted, begin. Yami remained perfectly still and waited for her opponent to make the first move. Her opponent however was trying to decide what he should do first, as he was hesitant to doing anything, since he knew what Yami was capable of from when she spared with the other students. Not to mention she was their class's top kunoiki and was probably the strongest one in their class. Eventually though, Yami's opponent made the first move and charged Yami with his fist raised. Yami although remained perfectly still and waited until her opponent was just about on top of her before disappearing right before her opponent's eyes. Before he even knew what had happened, Yami kicked her opponent in his forward leg, causing him to fall forward and using his own momentum to cause him to tumble forward several meters away. Naturally at seeing this many of the observers were impressed, since it took a very calm mind and extremely high skill to pull off a move like that and use an opponent's own momentum against them. Given how you have to hit a person at just right time and point to pull it off correctly. After recovering from his fall, Yami's opponent quickly picked himself up and did some hand seals before thinking, Doten, Doroden no Jutsu, Earth style, mud shot technique. And spitting out several globs of mud from his mount. When she saw the mud balls coming at her, Yami skillfully avoided most of them, although was unable to avoid them all, where one of them hit her left leg and hardened, reducing her speed. Seeing that one of his attacks hit, Yami opponent quickly took out some kunai and threw them at the blonde girl. But in an impressive show of incredible skill and speed, Yami caught all six kunai in midair before they could hit her and then threw them back at her opponent. Surprised by this, Yami's opponent was barely able to block react in time, where he used Doten, Doro Kugeshi to create a wall of earth to block the incoming kunai. But before the young man could bring the wall down, Yami quickly crossed the distance between them and in a feat of astonishing strength. She smashed right through the wall with her bare hands, which of course shocked the representatives from Kiri, Suna and Kanoa. Acting quickly the dark-skinned boy raised his fisted and attempted to punch Yami in the face, before his fist could make contact. Yami caught the boy's fist with her right hand and threw him at least 20 meters away from her and outside the square. Seeing this, the referee decided to end the match. With Naruto and the others. As the match ended, Naruto couldn't help but chuckle slightly at the disbelieving and shocked look on Sunid and most of the others' faces, as they couldn't believe the level of strength Yami had. How on earth did she do that? Asked a stunned Sakura. Could she have somehow used the same kind of technique that you and the Hokage used? Sai asked as he turned to look at Sakura. 
No she couldn't have, stated his wife Eno, I didn't sense her using any chakra. Then how did she do it? Asked Mogi. Simple, she used pure strength, nothing more, stated an amused Naruto. But how? Asked Sunid as she turned to the young blonde. To do something like that takes years of physical training and there's no way a child like her could have strength like that naturally. I'm afraid that is a classified hockage san, replied Naruto who suddenly became stern as they closed in on a sensitive subject. After which he got up from his seat and began to walk away so to congratulate his daughters on doing so well. But before he, Yugito and the others could leave, Shikamaru, who had been remained silent for most of the fight suddenly spoke. She's been genetically altered hasn't Naruto. The moment Shikamaru said this, Naruto snapped his head around and gave Shikamaru a hardened look, that made the young Nara flinch slightly. At the same time Yugito and the rest of Naruto wives all tensed up, where they quickly turned to stare at Shikamaru with surprised looks, as did Uki and the rest of the new Kumo Shinobi. Shikamaru what are you talking about? Asked Sunid as she turned to the young Jonan commander. That girl Yami has been genetically altered somehow so that she would have superhuman strength. It's the only explanation for her great strength without using any kind of technique, as Eno stated that she didn't sense her using any chakra. My guess is that she was involved in the same kind of experiments that gave the Ishida and Yuki clan members their bloodlines, stated Shikamaru, where he looked at Naruto and his wives for confirmation. Naturally Naruto and the other did not comment of this and remained silent, but that was enough to confirm what Shikamaru had said, where he decided to continue. I'm also willing to be, that like your other adopted daughters, something happened to her that involved you. That's why you adopted her, since you somehow feel responsible for whatever was done to her, am I wrong? Asked Shikamaru as he stared at his former blonde comrade. At this Naruto continued to remain silent, he of course thought about denying it and walking away. But knew Shikamaru or the other wouldn't let this go and the fact was Shikamaru had already guessed most of it, so there was no point in hiding it. After let out a large sigh, Naruto stared at Shikamaru. Huh, I should have known that you would have caught on Shikamaru. But to answer your question, yes you're correct, Yami has been genetically altered. During the civil war, the god I'm Reikage began to gather up people to experiment on, to find ways of increasing Kumo's power and its quality of shinobi. Both Yami and her parents were among the thousands of people that were taken away and experimented on. Both Yami's parents died during those experiments, while she and 50 others were placed in a special program called the Super Shinobi Program. The goal of the program, continued Naruto, was to create the perfect shinobi, who was stronger and faster than any other shinobi and felt no fear and obeyed orders without question. For several years they experimented on her and enhanced body making her faster and stronger and put her on a drug therapy that suppressed her emotion and made her more compliant to orders. So that's why she's so strong and acts the way she does, stated Jiraiya. Yes, although, she held back a great deal of her strength, so not to hurt the boy she was fighting. In fact according to our estimates by the time she reaches full maturity she could be as strong as Sunid and Haruno, and be as fast as Guy and Lee without their weights, although as I said, that is just an estimate. As for her emotional state, it has taken me this long just to get her to open up to me and the girls to that point and I'm not entirely sure if she can ever truly recover from the trauma she suffered. How did you find her? Asked Hanata. In the final months of the war, we discovered the location of the research base and I led the attack on it and found Yami. Later I found out what was done to her and decided to adopt her, although as Shikamaru said they're more to the reason than simply pity for what was done to her. What do you mean? Asked Lee. You see before we attacked the research lab, the Godime Reikage's forces somehow gained a sample of my blood from one of my battles with them. In an attempt to gain the Ranba car, Stormbreaker, limit for themselves, they injected my DNA into her. Hold on, are you saying that she has the Ranba car? Asked Homaru in surprise, while at the same time, thinking what this meant. No, the experiment only partially worked. What do you mean by partially? Asked Tenten. Yami did not gain my Ranba car limit, but she did gain my healing factor and is therefore immune to basically any kind of poison and can heal almost instantly from most injuries. Also it seems that when my DNA was inserted into her, her eye color changed from blue to red, the reason for this I believe is because of a combination of the alteration that were done to her and because of my DNA, since whether I like it or not. The QB is part of my DNA after it flooded my body with its chakra. 
After hearing this, the three groups were naturally surprised, since most of them had no idea how far the god I'm Reikage went to try and win the civil war and to make Kumo stronger. Danzo on the other hand found this news to be very interesting and found that the god I'm Reikage's super shinobi program could be quite beneficial if he could somehow implement it himself. So you adopted Yami-san because you felt responsible for what happened to her, stated Neji. Yes I do, but I also adopted her because I am probably the closest thing that she has left to a blood relative. Therefore it's my responsibility to care for her and help her, as she has no one else left and no child should have to grow up alone. After hearing this, the shinobi representatives fell silent, where many could not help but pity the young girl. As they could only imagine the suffering she must have went through, when she was being experimented on. Yugito of course placed her hand on Naruto's shoulder as a sign of support, since she knew how much Naruto blamed himself for what they put Yami through, when they injected his DNA, even though it wasn't really his fault. May I ask, what happened to the 50 others that were involved in the Super Shinobi program? Asked Shino. They're all dead, most of they died during the experiments that were placed on them. Those like Yami who survived the experiments were killed during our attack on the research base. Yami was the only survivor and before you ask she was the only one who was injected with my DNA, since they had only enough for one attempt. After hearing this, the three cages and their individual parties all nodded their heads in understanding, after which they all followed Naruto and his party down to the arena to congratulate the students for fighting so well and graduating. Down in the arena, you did great Yami ne, cheered Yoshiko as she ran up and greeted her older sister. Yeah, he never stood a chance against you said Nene, as she followed her twin and greeted her older sibling. I greatly appreciate, both your praise, thank you, both of you fought admirably as well. The three of you did great, as did everyone else here, stated a familiar voice to the three girls. When they turned around, they saw their father walking towards them, along with their mothers and the representatives of Kanoa, Kiri and Suna. Look, it's the rakage, cried one of the students when he saw the leader of their village walking towards them. Two san cried Nene and Yoshiko together, as they ran up and greeted their father, who congratulated the two girls as did the girls' mothers. Naruto even congratulated the rest of the graduating class, telling them that he was very proud of them all. I am surprised you came Oto-sama, as I did not think you would be able to come, due to your meeting with the representative of Iwa, spoke Yami, with her usual emotionless tone and blank expression as she walked up to Naruto and the others. Of course I would, I wouldn't miss this for the world, Naruto said as she smiled down a yami. But surely your meeting with the representative of Iwa takes a much higher precedence over our graduating matches. Stated Yami with her usual blank look. At this, Naruto knelt down to his adopted daughter and looked her directly in the eyes and said, As far as I am concerned, you, your sisters and your mothers are the most important things to me. I would rather be here and watch the three of you becoming genin, than be anywhere else. Although I do not fully understand your reasoning Oto-sama, I do understand your desire to be near us and appreciate your support, said Yami with the same expressionless look. Although as she said this, Naruto saw a small smile form on her face, indicating that she was indeed happy that he had come to watch them. Pleased with seeing this, Naruto hugged Yami, since she rarely smiled. Soon after he let go of her and watched as the three girls and the other students were given their headbands, officially making them genin of new Kumo. Once the girls had gotten their headbands, Naruto then stated that they would be heading to Ichiraku's restaurant to celebrate. As expected from any children of Naruto, both Nene and Yoshiko cheered loudly at having ramen. Even Yami seemed slightly pleased at this, stating that she found their ramen enjoyable. They even invited Aruka and his family, as well as Konohamaru and his team should join them, stating that they were family too and that the girls should get to know their aunts, and uncles, and their new cousin. Naturally neither Aruka or Konohamaru or any of the others could refuse Naruto's offer and left with the family, leaving Darui, Gurun and the others to escort the other representatives back to their hotel. As the representatives watched Naruto and his family walk out of the arena, some of the Kanoa members could not help but smile, as they saw Naruto laugh and talk away with his family. Since it reminded them of times back when Naruto was still with Kanoa and when he was young. It also reminded him that no matter how much Naruto had changed over the years, he still remained the same in what mattered most, he still had his kind and loving heart. That will be it for this video if you want more comment down below, like, subscribe. And see you guys later.